everyone. Welcome to the George S. Turnbull Portland Center. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, this is the uh, Portland base for the university's uh, School of Journalism and Communication. I'm Al Stavitsky, the director of the school, and we're delighted to, uh, to, to see so many folks here for our uh, event this evening embedded in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, we want to issue a, a special greeting to um, members of the uh, World Affairs Council of Oregon who are joining us this evening. Is that because I'm standing close to the... Uh, you know what? I project well, right? I've never been... That has never been a problem of mine as, a, as not being heard. So uh, let me say, we're, we're very pleased to, to uh, be partnering with the World Affairs Council of Oregon for uh, this event, and, uh, and we, we hope to see... Um, Council members back here for, uh, for more of the public events that, that we do here on a, on a regular basis, uh, both here in the Turnbull Center and throughout the, uh, the UO in Portland. And there were some flyers uh, uh, by the door of the film series that we do um, with uh, OPB and some of the events that the uh, Lifelong Learning um, Institute has and some of the other programs here as well as the White Box uh, Gallery. So uh, we, uh, we invite you to, uh, to take advantage of, of uh, the many programs that the UO has here in, uh, in Portland, and again, welcome. Uh, in addition to the World Affairs Council, we want to also thank our, our other uh, sponsors, our friends from, uh, from here in the building, the UO Portland Library and Learning Commons, and the, uh, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. Uh, the genesis of this event was uh, last summer when um, Dan Morrison uh, was sitting downstairs in the uh, in the lobby of the White Stag Block, uh, waiting for Callie to come uh, meet him, and they were going to get a ride to go to the airport for Afghanistan. And Dan was surrounded by the bags of uh, body armor and uh, photo gear, and uh, and so of course I had to say, "Can I try on?" I never had body armor on, so you know while I was. Putting that on, and uh, uh, I said to Dan, you know, when you get back, we we got to do an event on this. I mean, you've got to share the uh, the experiences uh, that you have. And uh, Dan, being the can-do guy he is, said absolutely. And then uh, he told Callie that, that she was roped into this uh, this event as uh, as well. And uh, and so here we are, uh, uh, these months later. So it's, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dan and, uh, and Callie uh, to you. Uh, and then I'm going to get out of the way here and enjoy this uh, presentation along with you. Um, Professor Dan Morrison has been a member of the School of Journalism and Communication faculty for six years after a distinguished professional career as a photojournalist that uh, took him to more than 30 countries and uh, five war zones. He is a leader on our faculty in the transition to multimedia reporting, which uh, you'll, you'll learn more uh, about. And notably, here in Portland, uh, Dan led a, a team of student journalists in our digital urban journalism uh, project, which was generously supported by the, uh, the Jackson Foundation. Uh, that project has been uh, reporting on stories and issues in Old Town Chinatown in partnership with the Oregonian. And you can see a gallery of some of the student work in the uh, in the hallway uh, as you um, as you come and go uh, this evening, and uh, we hope to to have some uh, some new work on the Oregonians' uh, website uh, later this month uh, from that team. Um, we are also very proud to claim Callie Bagby as an alumna of uh, of our school, class of 2008. Uh, since then, get this. She has served as a volunteer journalist in Vietnam and Bangladesh for the uh, Prosthetic Outreach Foundation. She spent a year in Iraq as an embedded journalist with Oregon medevac and infantry units. She went on a 1,300-mile bicycle trip through five national parks, sending back multimedia reports for WEN magazine. Oh, and then there was this summer in, uh, in Afghanistan. So uh, please join me in welcoming uh, to the Turnbull Center, Kelly Bagby and Dan Morrison. Thank you. Uh, let me say a couple of things. Explain to them why they were, they were listening to really bad news. Um, so I just wanted to give everyone a feel for what it is like being inside one of the 
armored vehicles called a MRAP, which is Mine Resistance Ambush Protected Vehicle. And some of you might think that the Marines listen to really hard music, and they do listen to a little Metallica, but for the most part, this music, um, which is more like, you know, what I think a lot of 16-year-old girls are into right now, pop music, is what was currently heard playing around the tents or inside the vehicles. So I just wanted to make things a little bit fun, and, but give you an idea of what it looks like to be inside one of those vehicles. And I want to tell you sort of how this is going to work tonight. We're going to show you a couple of very short clips, and then I'm, uh, am I going first? Or I'm going to still. Callie goes first, she's going to show you some still. I can't remember. And then I'm going to show some stills, and then I'm going to show a video she's going to show, and I'm going to show and she's going to show them. And then we're going to open up for questions, okay? And we certainly encourage you to ask us a lot of questions. I will tell you right from the outset, um, if you're going to ask us the question, are we winning or losing the war, and should we be there? It's not anything to do with what we do. Our whole mission in this thing, Kelly and I talked about this a lot before we went, and we certainly talked about it a lot while we were in country. Our hope was to bring back to the American people at least a glimpse of what frontline Marine infantry troops go through on a daily basis. If you want to talk about whether we should be in Afghanistan in the first place or whether the war is going well or not, that's a whole different conversation which this evening is not about. Okay? So there's that. I will also tell you, Al, David, <coughs> I put on my body armor that day, and you're welcome to do it sitting right out there at the table. It only weighs about 65 pounds, and you can put it on. And uh, we, we, we're going to show you something in a second. We wish there was some way, because we really wanted people to get an idea of what it's like to be there. It's not possible. It's 125 degrees for one thing. Uh, there's a lot of dust, and it's just, and, and people are shooting at you. You can play all the video games in the world you want, and watch all the war movies you want. It's just not the same. But we are going to try to show you at least, give you sort of a glimpse of what these people are doing. So having said that, one of the things that people always, and we have a lot of stories to tell, but we have to keep it relatively brief to them. But one of the things people always say is like, what is it like to be under fire? Um, I was there six weeks, but it takes about a week to get in and about a week to get out. So the truth of the matter is, I was actually in the combat area for about a month. Uh, Callie was there in almost two and a half months because she stayed an additional six weeks and she was at the front line. She went places I didn't even want to go. Um, but it, just a quick set of how this comes up. It's an enormously difficult process to get permission to go as an embed. It took us about four months of constant emails and paperwork and back and forth and all that. And even though they're not here, a shout out to the folks at KVAL who gave us credentials to go. Um, but you have to actually be invited by a unit commander to go. And if you don't know a unit commander, they have to find someone who will invite you if you don't go. So it's an enormously difficult process. And the nut of all that is, right before we left, two things happened that had a lot of impact on what we were doing. One was a Rolling Stone article that came out by Michael Hastings, which got um, General McChrystal relieved of duty. And I thought, wow. That came out like two weeks before we were supposed to leave. And we got an email. I got an email. Kelly was actually on that bicycle trip while this was going on. So we were trying to buy body armor and everything via email while she was riding a bike. And they didn't have the color khaki in. <laughs> <laughs> so and they wouldn't you sell have to call us. another yeah. place with the commander saying you have to have khaki yeah. body armor. But we got an email when that Rolling Stone article came out. They said, that's it. You're not coming over. And it's like, wow. And we already bought. $4,000 worth of gear. The body armor itself costs $1,200. Helmets another 350 etc. It just get piles up. We had both purchased non-refundable round trip tickets, which are about two grand each. And so we said, wow, we can't go. So a lot of furious emailing back and forth. And we finally got permission again to go. And what had happened was a friend of a friend, the retired Marine officer in Eugene, had set us up with a guy he knew. And I had spent many, many emails over the course of a couple of months getting to know him to where eventually he said, okay, you guys can come embed in our unit. And four days, literally four days before we were supposed to fly, he got transferred to a different place. Like, oh, and then we had no place to go. So when Cal and I flew out of PDX, she actually flew way time we went in, which is sort of a strange way to do it. We had no idea where we were going. They sent us to a place called Camp Leatherneck, which is the largest Marine Corps base in the country. We specifically requested Hillman Province because we knew that was where most of the <coughs> fighting was taking place. And we went to Camp Leatherneck, which is a city. I mean, it really is a city. And we thought, well, not much going on here. And, and then they came a couple of days later, and they said, we're going to send you down to another base called Dwyer, which people said, ooh, hot water. And so we, we went there for a couple of days. And we're like, well, there was stuff going on there, but not much. And then a couple of days later, they said, we're going to send you to Marja. And people said, ooh, no, not Marja. And Cal and I both knew at the time that Marja was the hottest uh, the most dangerous place in all of Afghanistan. That's shifted a little bit right now because they're in the Sands of Valley fighting, but when we were there, it was the most dangerous place in the entire country. 
So that's where we went. And then we got to, to Mars, and they said, do you want to, after we were there for a few days, they asked us if we wanted to go out to the front line units, which is the people who go out and patrol every day. And we said, yes. So they sent us there. And then they, while we were there, they said, do you want to go even to a smaller outpost? And we said, yes. And Cal and I used to joke that eventually they were going to stick us in a foxhole with one Marine. And, and before Callie left, it really almost happened to her. She actually went on patrol with basically one Marine. It's like the craziest thing I've ever heard. Well, that's a little bit more than this. Story. Not much. But, <laughs> but in any case, people always say, well, what's it like? Well, it's just, I mean, you try to imagine that body in which weighs 50, 60 pounds, depending on how you have it here. You got your helmet, your camera, and all that. It is 125 degrees. It is so hot, it is just unbearable. You feel like your brain is cooking. And you're running across the field sprinting while the person with the machine gun is shooting at you trying to kill you. Is that what it's, that's, that's what it's like. And it's not every time you go out, but almost every time you go out. So, a couple minutes of that, just so you know. That's all what, uh, that's in case you don't know. <laughs> hey, that's where we were. Just right there. I have to go down the volume. No, just the volume. Make sure ain't nobody in here. Come up there too, man. that you know that there's actually, for those of you who've been in the military, you know this, but it's always surprising to people who've never been in the military, there are rules to how you fight wars. This is this is the new set of rules that they're fighting the Afghanistan war. This was written by Petraeus. This is the account of the Manual. And if you have a question on what you should do, it's in here. Okay. And it's also very important, you know, they're trying to learn from some of the mistakes, not only from Vietnam especially, but also the mistakes they made in Iraq. The rules of engagement are such that the reason the Marines run directly into the to the ambush is directly into it, because that's what's safest thing to do in an ambush in any case, but they try to get there before the Taliban leave. The rules of engagement are, unless the person has a weapon in his hand, you're not allowed to shoot. So the Taliban who will shoot, and as soon as the Marines get close enough, they'll lay their weapon down and they just walk off into the crowd. And since they no longer have a weapon, you're not allowed to shoot. Okay? That's the rules of engagement. It's called winning hearts and minds. I find it a bit odd, but that is what the world they live by. Unless they, I mean, if they see the guy shooting and, and then they see him walk away, then they could. But oftentimes they certainly don't see him. He's behind the wall. And unless they can, it's called positive R&D, unless they get hit on him, what they call it, they, they, they're not allowed to take him in or anything else. 
and they sprint there. They hope to sprint there and cut them off before they can melt away into the, to the, to the local region. So that's the one reason they sprint. I will tell you, again, I really thought, I had been in combat patrols before. I thought we would go out with 20, 30, 40, you, put, you go out with four people on the fire team. Callie Cal and I were sometimes, not always, but sometimes we're on patrols together, but she was way over there and I was way over here. That's it. It's you and four guys walking across the field until you get shot at, and then you sprint. And Cal and I were talking about, well, you don't want to be behind the first guy because if he's the point guy, they're going to try to kill him. And you certainly don't want to be behind the last guy because they'll ambush him with the pine. And the guy in the middle is carrying the light automatic weapon, machine gun, so you don't want to be near him. It's like the, there is no safe place to be. That's what and they do. On one patrol that I went on, they told one of the journalists, I was with some other journalists, and they told her not to stand in front of the Afghan national <laughs> soldiers because they might accidentally shoot her or shoot who's in front of them because they're not, you know, their training isn't across the board. You might have someone that's really well trained and someone that's not. So that's another thing that you have to think about. If there's an ANA behind <clears> you, uh, maybe that's not the best situation. And the other thing is, I assume most of you people know this, but some of the Marines were surprised by this. No, we did not carry a weapon. No, we were not allowed to touch a weapon. It was against the Geneva Convention for a journalist to touch a weapon in a war zone. So we were unarmed the entire time. And the truth of the matter is, once we got, certainly past Bob Marge, once you left what's called leaving the wire, you were in, everybody out there wants to kill you. And you were absolutely the worst nightmare would be separated from the troops and be captured. You would, you would die a very horrible death. But you're not armed. And, and we, there were, we'll come up later, but there were times we thought, we get, if we get overrun and we're alive, what do we do? Okay. So, with that. That's me. Um, so to give you some background, I, three months after I graduated from the University of Oregon, I was invited by a friend of mine who was the commander of the medevac unit out of Salem, Oregon, to go to Iraq for a year. Um, and he wanted me to go not for six months, but for a year, or not at all. So I decided to take that uh, offer, and I went for a year, and during that time, Dan had been my professor while I was in school at the University of Oregon. And then he kind of became my mentor because he had done combat journalism. And so we really, I called him more than I called my parents because I was constantly needing, you know, to ask someone questions, and you know, it was my first job out of college. And in December, I got a... It's a tough internship. <laughs> there are no internships in Afghanistan. Someone asked me that the other day, just to clarify. That I know of, student internships. Um, so in December, Dan sent me an email, and he said, you know, I really, I want to go to Afghanistan. I'm going to start working on it. And although he didn't ask me, I wrote him back and said, there is no way that I'm going back to the desert. And, you know, I just, I wanted to get out of the Middle East. Um, but I told them that I knew myself that probably in six months I would change my mind. And within probably three weeks of being home, I decided to start going through this process. And you know, it's been an amazing experience to go to Afghanistan with someone who's been your mentor and now is your colleague and to watch them work. So for me, that was just incredible. And you know, the guys always thought it was funny that you know, they're like, is he your dad or your boss? <laughs> and I say, well, no. Grandfather. But he was my professor at the University of Oregon, so. No, they, there, were, there really was a time when I was in the truck and they couldn't see me, and she was over there, and people were talking to her. And I leaned over and said, that's my car. And they were like, oh, my God, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so we had a really great time going and, um, you know, representing the University of Oregon, which has been really great to throw this event to support us um, while we were there. And then before she launches into it, because I'll have to forget this, I will say that it, one of the most rewarding things of being a teacher is when you have a student <coughs> who becomes your teacher and your master, especially within two years, which I didn't think that would happen. But because Kelly had been in Iraq for a year, when we went to Afghanistan, I was in a position saying, what do we do now? I mean, I, I'm, I've never done this. I, you know, I've been in wars, but what the heck do we do now? And for two years out of school to have a student <coughs> to accomplish as much as she did, it was just astounding. It, was, it just was so rewarding. And yes, we wanted to choke each other to death sometimes, but, but, but it really was just like, you know, I see her working out there and think, oh my gosh, how does she do that? So, so. How can I go So like Dan said before, um, you know, we want to try to give you the experience of what we had over there, and, and the best way to do it is through images. 
This is um, one of the first firefights that I was in, First, one of the first patrols um, in all the you know, different areas that are in the landscape varies. Um, this is a picture of a Marine going through a cornfield, which I always felt great in the cornfield as far as being camouflaged. Dan <coughs> felt differently, but um, so, you know, but you're walking through these huge cornfields and because of the irrigation, they're in like the 40s and 50s, USAID built irrigation ditches there, so there are a lot of the areas that are farming, there is greenery, there is vegetation in the desert. Same uh, marine later on that patrol. Um, this is after um, we'd received contact, so there had been shots fired from the north or south, whatever direction it was. So there had been shots fired, and um, so all the Marines dropped down, and then they told me to run. So we were all running across this field to basically a mud burn. And so we're all sitting on this burn. You know, he's wiping the sweat out of his eyes, which is one of the worst things for me out there is you get so, you know, sweaty, you're running, and you can't see anything, and then you wipe your eyes, and your hands are covered in dirt. Um, <clears throat> and also at this point, he was, he was asked, you know, this is in the middle of the firefight, and he's asking me, what's your name again? And I said, Callie, and he's like, oh, isn't that the doctor from Grey's Anatomy? You know, I think it's, you're probably gonna laugh at me that I'm watching this, my girlfriend watched it. And I'm thinking, this is like, you know, we're getting shots again, and he takes off and runs, and I'm thinking this, because, you know, you see that in the movies, and you think, well, that's, you know, totally fake, but, you know, we both had experiences where these random conversations would happen, and, you know, what I was thinking about, I gotta get the shot, or where are the Taliban shooting from, and a little, Great anatomy conversation. <laughs> so after um, we received this gunfire, um, you know, like Dan said, they're running towards the gunfire to see if they can make contact with the enemy. Um, and in a lot of cases, they would refer the Taliban as ghosts because once they would get to the area where the firefight was coming from, they would be gone. And in this case, they found um, bullet casings from, or shells from the bullets. And that was the only evidence they had that there had been Taliban shooting there. But they do go through the doors and they'll go into all these compounds, which are little mud buildings. And so this is just a picture of a Marine. Um, you know, telling these guys, it's okay, they're gonna search this compound. And this is another Marine who's trying to get the ANA, which is Afghan National Army soldier to come in. The ANA are required to go in first um, into the compound before the Marines can. In this incident, in this day, the ANA soldier did not want to go into the building. So every door we had to stop in for like five minutes, and the Marines would have to, you know, start almost physically pushing him in because he was so um, terrified. <coughs> this is inside a mud building. One of the Marines, um, they found pieces of paper, and the ANA soldier believed that there were incriminating words on the piece of paper. It was like RPG and IED. So they took the person into custody and they told us to be careful not to call. He was a person of interest versus a detainee. A detainee is only when they have real solid evidence and they're gonna take a person in. A person of interest is someone they're just going to further question. So as soon as that person was um, taken into custody and they were, we were heading back to the base, uh, a bunch of the guys saw some of the helicopters were flying off from a medevac mission, and they said whenever helicopters leave the air, the Taliban will start shooting again because they know there's no longer air support. Um, so then right away, we start getting shots again in our direction, and they run back into this compound, and they're convinced that the Taliban are in this building. So I go in there, and you know we hear all this gunfire um, from, the, from the guys that had gone in first, so we run in, and they were just firing a lock off because they couldn't get a lock off the door. There were no Taliban there. And, you know, this is basically what I saw. It's like the dust, you know, there's this gun, gun shuts going off and there's just this fog. And so that's kind of my, what I saw when I was in there. This is another um, patrol that I was on, the second firefight that I was in. Um, this one lasted about 20 minutes, um, which seems like, several hours go by in that 20 minute span. Um, so as you can see here, you can kind of see there's water. This is one of the irrigation ditches that was filled with water. So what happened was we're on the patrol, we started getting, taking contact, taking fire from the enemy. 
So we start running in that direction. We get to the wadi, and you have to go in the wadi um, to take cover. He decided to stay above the water. Um, so there's another picture of that Marine um, shooting at the enemy. You can see, you know, one of the things about the wet wadis is you're taking cover from the firefight, you're, you know, for like five minutes or two minutes, you're getting soaked, and then you have to run across these huge fields. On this day, we ran about 300 meters, and you're running over terrain that is this dry dirt, and it's little divots in it, and they just, the Marines just jump from one divot to the next, and so, <coughs> as journalists, you know, one of our biggest fears is to keep up with them, and, um, you know, so that, and the next field after that had, like, cotton, so there was all these vines that were in the cotton, and you just, you just have to um, run with them. This is a photo of a Marine um, taken after they were able to get close enough to the shooters to um, get a positive identification that they were actually holding weapons and shooting, and they were able to shoot one of the Taliban. And all this will be in a video later, too. One of the things I got to do early on was spend four hours with the corpsman, who's basically the medic for the unit. And the man on the right with the lollipop in his mouth, um, he had been up that day since five in the morning. He worked from five to noon, and he had patients coming in all day. The majority of his patients were small children that get you know, a cut or something, and then they're swimming in this dirty water they don't have medical care, so these little cuts would have these huge sores and really terrible infected wounds. Uh, this picture is taken of a man that someone brought in on a truck, and so the medics actually ran outside of the base, which they're not supposed to do, and grabbed him and took him in because he was unconscious. This is a photo of a father of one of the patients. He had, <coughs> his son had a blood nose, and so he put tissue up his nose and it got left there for, pieces of it got left for over a month, and so it was horribly infected. So he brought his son in to have them look at it. This is one of the female Marines from the female engagement team. <coughs> and the female engagement team is a new thing that they've been doing where they'll have, um, in, where we were, they had two females assigned to a company, so about 100 men. and. Um, they do go on patrols, they do carry weapons. A lot of the stuff that they're doing is interacting with the women because in a lot of cases, the Afghan women can have no interaction with the male Marines. Um, they do some um, searching and security as far as, you know, if there's a, I was on some patrols where there'd be a female Afghan woman wearing, you know, burqa or something similar to a burqa and the females um, can, can check those women without offending their culture. So the story behind this photo is she had the tattoo of Forever, um, when she was dating her previous boyfriend, and he also had the Forever tattoo. And then when they broke up, she got nothing less. <laughs> 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 tattoo. Um, and she told me that her boyfriend had also the same tattoo, and his solution was to break his arm so that he would have a scar through Forever. So he was also a Marine. <laughs> so they're pretty tough. Um, this is another, this is actually a corpsman, not part of the female engagement team, but they flew her down to Marja for one day because they really needed to get into this female Afghan doctor's home and check out because the Marines were funding um, this female doctor, but they needed to assess the clinic. And the husband of the doctor said, you know, the male Marines, they cannot come here. We don't want any males here. So they had to fly in a medic and a female doctor from a larger base and I was also allowed to go in. And so the three of us were able to go in and look at the clinic and talk to the female doctor. I don't have any pictures of her though because they asked, um, almost all the female Afghan women I met, they asked me not to take their picture. Or more their husbands or brothers or sons asked me for them not to take their picture. This is another um, female Marine on patrol from the female engagement team. This is a young Afghan girl. Uh, on a lot of the patrols that I went on, especially after I'd been there for a long time, and um, towards the middle of September, things were fairly quiet for a while, and you would see kids, um, a lot of times, um, not as many female children, um, and you would rarely, I think the whole time that we were there, we saw maybe three adult females, Afghan females. 
Um, and occasionally you'd see female girls. Sometimes, I mean, I thought most of the time when we saw kids, it meant that it was gonna be a relatively safe day. I know a lot of the Marines said that that wasn't true and that the Taliban did not care and that they, there would be firefights and IEDs when there were kids around. This is another Afghan uh, child, well, child, probably 10, uh, young man, but he, uh, he was employed by the Marines at a base to pick up trash and do that kind of stuff. This is an Afghan man who was working as a contractor for the Marines, and the Marines would pay him to go clean irrigation canals. And on one of the days that he was out cleaning, <clears throat> some men approached him and told him that they would harm him if he continued to work with the American military. He said that he was going to continue working, and he was stabbed uh, three times, and somehow it didn't hit any critical arteries, and he was fine. When Dan and I interviewed him, he said that as soon as his wounds were healed, he was going to continue working as a contractor for the Marines. And he says, um, the Taliban is my enemy and I am their enemy. This is um, a photo of a Marine and one of the elders from the village. And this is just showing that um, one thing the Marines are really trying to do is get uh, to show that they're culturally sensitive. So during Ramadan, which is the Muslim religious observance, the Marines were told not to drink water in front of the locals, even on like four hour patrols in 120 degree weather because um, the Muslim culture was fasting. So that was something that they really, truly did work on. This is a Marine um, during one patrol uh, and he's watching as conversation ensues between a Marine and one of the locals. And he was trying to get the local to show him where the elder of the area lived. And basically the conversation went like, the local man said, I'm not going to help you. You can do whatever you want. I won't help you. And the Marine trying to get him to help him, uh, which is something that happens a lot. And, and I saw a lot of the time that I was there, these conversations that were very circular and would go on. And, the Marines would get frustrated, and sometimes the locals really, you know, were just adamant they weren't, they did not want to be involved with the Marines. They did not want to be seen being involved with the Marines. Um, if if they did work with them, a lot of times they wanted it to be uh, away from the village, not something where everyone was going to see what they were doing. On that day that we were looking for this elder's house, um, there was a firefight, and during the firefight they pulled out four individuals, four young men that they thought looked like the people that had been shooting at the Marines. And they brought them over and took their cell phones and we're gonna later check to see if there's anything suspicious on their cell phones. And then later um, they found hash on them, these little bags. And so the, the Marines that were talking to these four Afghan men were saying, well, you know, do you have any brothers, kid brothers, kid sisters? I mean, how would you feel if they were doing drugs? And they gave them this lecture on, um, you know, safety and don't do drugs. And then they gave him the hash, took the cell phones, and let him go. <laughs> this young man came to one of the um, combat outposts, which is um, towards the front line, a smaller uh, base with probably only a hundred or so Marines. This was on the last day of Ramadan, so it was during Eid, which is the celebration day after the month long observance of fasting. And he had woken up that morning, sent his kid, three kid brothers out into the field, and they were hit by an IED. Uh, one of the brothers died on impact, and the other two he took to the base to get medical treatment. Um, and one of the female Marines was actually the one that dealt with him. And one of the things, I mean, they're usually, from what I heard, there's never IEDs in a field. So that was one of the confusing points that had it been in a field, that's just something that doesn't happen very often. And these are his, him on the right, and escorting his two brothers to higher levels of medical care. This is um, Lance Corporal Gil Frazier, um, another Marine that I spent some time with. And this is on a patrol where, again, they had persons of interest, two guys that looked suspicious during a firefight. Um, he's questioning the young men and he keeps asking them, 
you know, why were you out in this area during a firefight? That, you know, that doesn't make sense to me. And the guy is saying, well, I wanted to go to my uncle's house. And he's saying, well, why did you do it during the firefight? And he says, well, because I wanted to get there. And, um, you know, and that's the thing, like, you do see people, usually people will leave the area during a firefight if it's in the area. But because it's so common there, for a lot of people, it is just part of their daily routine. That if they need to get to their uncle's house, the firefight isn't necessarily going to stop them. Could he have been a spotter? And by spotter, I mean someone that's on their cell phone calling the Taliban and letting them know the marine location. He could have been, but also it's very likely that he really just needed to get to his uncle's. So those um, young men were brought into the base, and um, they were there at the base for further questioning for about five minutes, because the captain of that base had made a deal with the local elders that if they came in and vouched for any persons of interest, that they would be released immediately. So they brought them in and released them. This is a picture of one of the first voters um, for the parliamentary election in mid-September in Marja. Um, they had a few voters in the morning, but it really tapered off during the middle of the afternoon because there were firefights, basically three or four firefights going on surrounding the area of the polling sites, and there were RPGs coming over the polling site, which is a school, and so the colonel of the battalion they were with really hoped for um, a big turnout, but in almost everywhere in Afghanistan there were firefights, the Taliban were really making a move to make sure the elections didn't go well. During, um, during that day, we, they had some intel that the base was going to get attacked, which I told everyone that it was not going to get attacked because what's the likelihood of that happening? Uh, but they, an RPG was launched into the base. It hit a tent where there were two Marines in the tent. No one was wounded, but they told us all that we had to put our Kevlar on our helmets and go into a bunker. And we were in this bunker for four hours, which everyone thought was very amusing because there was no cover on the bunker, so it's a wide open cover <laughs> on this huge concrete bunker. This is a Marine at the end of a patrol. Um, some of the patrols go four hours, some of them go eight hours, some of them leave five in the morning, um, some of them end in the middle of the afternoon, and some of them end uh, at night. I was on a few that ended really late at night, which wasn't my favorite time of day to go on patrol, um, but, it was really beautiful as the sun was up. This is an EOD technician, which is an explosive ordnance disposal um, technician. So like uh, anyone seen the Hurt Locker, the bomb squad guys, uh, Dan and I went out with him while he was rendering an IED safe and then detonating it. This is another day out with the IED guys. Um, he's basically, you know, they have, um, they'll have a line of trucks and those guys will be performing security outside and inside and watching what's going on. So this is basically what he's watching. This is um, Staff Sergeant Hernandez, who right there, there's an IED in there and he's working on it. And it was about half an hour of us, you know, the guys pulling security, but then you're just watching him work on this IED. And it's, I was about ready to pull my hair out just because, you know, he's right there, you know the IED, you don't know exactly what he's doing. Um, Luckily, they were able to take the IED out, um, and at, at this point, he's rendered it safe. So they're able to approach it, look at, look at it, and then um, Hernandez will take it into the field and they'll do what's called a controlled detonation. And I also have a video of that, too. During that day where we did the IED sweep, so basically, before they found the IED, we were walking for, I think that day, up to seven hours on these dirt roads, and basically looking for IEDs. And during that, so what I said at the time was like the only thing worse than being out here looking for IDs is being in a firefight, and then a firefight starts about a half mile away. So you know, during we're wondering is it going to come this way, you know, and, and so it's it's very chaotic. It's not chaotic for the guys because they know who's pulling security and who's working on finding the IDs, and they don't deviate from that. Um, so the firefight was happening at this base, which is a really really small mid base where you could see all sides of it. And an RPG, well there was a, a guy staying on the post, and so he's staying up on this wall, just like this guy, and he's scanning the area, and he sees a guy with an RPG, which is, you know, a missile that he's gonna launch. So he jumps off, and the RPG hits the wall, shoots rocks out, knocks the guy down onto the ground, and 
you know, this is the hole from the RPG. The guy gets back right on, starts doing security again. Later in the day, a medic comes and says, you know, you probably have a class one concussion. I interview the guy and he says, no, I haven't had a headache, I feel dizzy, but I smoked a cigar and I'm good to go. <laughs> so that's, that's the Marine here all there. This is an Oregon Reservist Marine who's in the gunner position, which is on top of the vehicle. There's a little turret, and that's where they're doing security. Um, he would spend, you know, before this picture was taken, he was out for a month where he and three other guys will take turns manning the gun. One will sleep, the other one will be up there for five to six hours, and they'll just go 24 hours doing security. Um, in this case, they were doing security for engineers combat engineers, they were doing road construction, so, and they work at night, so these guys, someone has to be up 24 hours a day, and they usually have the driver will be up, and then the gunner will be up, and someone will take a nap, and they just rotate. They get out of the trucks very little in that month. I mean, they're living inside the trucks, they're living with their armor on every day. And that, for me, I did that for five days, and that was the roughest. I thought it wasn't even gonna last for five days, just because there's no, you're just in the desert, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. There are no bathrooms. There's no food outside of the plastic bag. So it, um, that was the, the roughest living condition. And luckily it was, it was safe uh, for the most part. There were um, a lot of IEDs in the area later on, but um, that was that. This is, so <clears throat> Dan and I went on a patrol at one in the afternoon. And it was a foot patrol, and so we were getting ready to go on this foot patrol, and the captain says, well, do you want to, someone's driving there, so do you want to drive there? And I say, well, no. And Dan goes, well, whatever Callie wants. And I said, well, I think we should walk. Well, whatever Callie wants. I was hoping so, she would say, let's ride the truck. <laughs> so I thought it would be a really great experience to go on a four-hour patrol at one in the afternoon in like, I just had to be like 120. They kept saying it was 90-something, which I don't know why someone would lie about. <laughs> but, um, so like, we're on this patrol, you know, I wanted to go, but after even the first hour, I'm feeling like, it is so hot, and you sweat, and you're jumping over these berms, and these wadis, and these big, you know, strong guys are just like leaping around, and I'm, you know, trying to keep up with them, and, you know, thoughts of my own self-misery were going on, but the guy next to me was this guy, so you can't really see it, but the backpack on his back adding with his gun and everything is about 90 pounds of weight. And on top of that, he is, they choose that he's gonna have to pull security for me. So he's now in charge of this civilian journalist who's gonna ask him questions. And, which I don't know how he got that job, but, and, and you go out there and you know that these guys will take a bullet for you, no question. If it came down to it, they're gonna do their job, they're gonna have security for you. And then on top of that, he's telling me that he just got shot in the arm three weeks ago and that they wanted to keep him and send him to Germany, but he didn't want to. All he wanted to do was get back on patrol. So four hours later, I am you know, feeling really tired. Like I've got my weight uh, of gear and it's so hot. And it's like, you cannot complain when you're walking next to this guy. You know, I mean, there's just no way to feel sorry for yourself. And if you do, then you just feel horribly guilty. So. Um, he was just one of the people that I met, and I'm like, I just can't believe, I can't believe they wouldn't make you go home. And there was another guy in the unit that had been shot three times, and he demanded to come back, and they wouldn't let him go on patrols anymore, but he was allowed to stay on the base. And almost, I met three or four guys that had been seriously injured, and they all fought so hard to get back to their unit. That's all they cared about. This is um, one of the memorials I went to. There were three memorial services held in one day because the unit had had three of their Marines killed in action for three days. This is for Lance Corporal Cody Childers. And what they do for the memorial is they'll have boots, um, the rifle, dog tags, and the helmet to symbolize the fallen Marine and the um, Marine Corps flag and the U.S. flag. And um, I had never been to a military memorial service of any kind, and the one here, it was very much like a funeral. They had the chaplain talk, and they also gave an opportunity for the friends of the fallen to give their own testimonials. Um, and to give, I mean, the thing that it gave those Marines that were there that one hour to grieve, to actually experience that loss in a small way. Because most of the time that you're there, 
you really don't have time to dwell on what's going on. You don't have time to grieve. You don't have time to, you know, really feel things. So this gave them kind of a small window to do that. And <clears throat> what the Marines would do is they'd put their, um, they gave at the end opportunity for the Marines to come and salute the boots and the Kevlar and to say their own personal goodbyes. And this young man's putting his hand on the boot. Um, typically they would kiss the dog tag um, and say goodbye like that. A <coughs> um, couple things that you're coming through, coming in here, sort of the foyer area thing. One of the things we have laid out on the table is MREs and these things that look like little sandwich bags. Um, and there's some chewing tobacco out there, and there's some Red Bull. Uh, the reason that's out there is because people say, well, well what's it like? Well, for one thing, when well, we got, we eventually got to a compound that was half the size of this room. And there were 10 men in there, and they had been there for 29 days. And they were in the middle of nowhere, surrounded. And, and we said, isn't that the place we were going to? And I said, please come and tell me about the truck. I was so hot. Uh, but we talked until then, and we said, well, how do you sleep at night? I mean, you're surrounded by the Taliban. I mean, they would get in a circle, and so no matter which way the Taliban were coming over the walls, they could shoot in all directions. 29 days. How they do this stuff is just beyond me. But, but the, the daily routine, like, well, what's it like? Well, for one thing, uh, they shower maybe once a week, maybe once every two weeks, whatever. They still shave all the shower. They still shave all the time, because they're still Marines. But there's no restrooms, so they defecate in those plastic bags we have out on the table, and you throw it in a burn pit. There's a burn pit in every base that burns 24 hours a day, and all the garbage, including human waste, is being burned. And so the base smells like diesel, because all these giant trucks run on diesel and burning waste and, and all this stuff. And the other thing is, because they're trying to win hearts and minds, they're, I mean, the Marines are very strict about not doing anything that will offend the locals. So there is, there's no alcohol at all, and there's, there's never any drugs in the Marine Corps. I don't know, but there's, there's not, there's not supposed to be. So, but the interesting thing over there as well is that the traditional things, at the very least, you know, the pinup girls on the painting on the front noses of the bombers and what was no. You know, girly magazines, no, not at all, no. Um, so, in fact, I got a Marine in trouble because I took a picture, he was in his, in his machine gun turret, and there was a picture of a woman in a bikini. Wouldn't talk with him in a bikini, but he, he got in trouble when they saw that he had stuck that on his turret. So that might be offensive to the local folks. Okay, so that's, that's what it's like. I mean, when they go out on patrol, they risk their life every day. Or sometimes four hours, sometimes eight hours, depending, depending on they come back to absolutely nothing. There's nothing to do. Uh, the, the group that I was that I like to hang around with the most, and Kelly got to be pretty good buds too, called Cat Five. They would try to amuse themselves by having contests to see who could drink the most water before they would vomit. <laughs> I think the bet was seven leagues. I think I won five bucks on that bet, or whatever. But and, and they would see how many caffeine pills they gave before they would throw up. And so there's nothing to do. In this picture, because my wife loves it, my lovely wife is not here, although I saw the first one, I thought she's not there. You go back there. Anyways, I think that is one of the corniest, most macho looking things ever. But it's a picture of me. I just came off parole, uh, patrol, or parole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, excuse me. I just came off patrol. Um, I'm old, I'm 58, but I was in the Marine Corps from 70 to 74. And so I was older than the Lieutenant Colonel, and I was older than everybody. And these people would come up, the word got out, and they would come up kind of shy, and they would say, where were you at? I said, I fought with General Lee at Gettysburg. And they go, ah. <laughs> <laughs> and they go, no, no, that's not possible. <laughs> this is a typical tent. Now, some of the bases, some of the larger bases, by the way, a FOB is forward operating base. A camp is a big place. A FOB, which is margin, where we got, that's where commanders are and all that stuff. Colonels and people like that and all kinds of classified stuff that we saw that we're not supposed to talk about. Um, and then you go from a FOB out to a COP, which is a combat outpost, and then you go out to just an outpost, an outpost, and then you go into sometimes just these little drawn off little things. But it's some of the FOBs, some of these things are actually air conditioned, believe it or not. They have these giant generators that some of these tents are actually air conditioned. But that's it, there's about 18 men, and they don't shower, and they burp and fart, and that's what they do all the time. And if you notice too, by the way, everybody has a body armor right there, because that we were actually attacked here. We were attacked a couple times in a basin. You need to be able to, in total darkness, reach over, grab it, and put it on the ear. Typical day. I mean, it's called moon dust over there. It just gets in everything. So, and somebody was laughing, saying, you know that the journalist doesn't know what they're doing in Afghanistan when they're trying to keep their cameras clean. It's impossible. It's just futile, so don't even bother. It's just 
and glue them on the camera. Uh, one of the reasons I have a camera hanging off my body mark is because that's the one I dropped in the water. Right? $3,000 camera, wow. I mean, it's brutal over there in a few years. Filling sandbags. I think Marines have been doing this since Marine Corps was founded in 1775, and they just do it for the hell of it. Have <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing to do today? We'll fill some sandbags. What do you say? So, actually, that's a sandstorm. A sandstorm is real scary because when the sandstorms blow in, that one was a three day long sandstorm, the helicopters can't fly. So if you get wounded, they have what's called the golden hour. If you get wounded, a helicopter medevac will probably be there within 10 to 15 minutes and have you back at a medical base within about the same amount of time, certainly within an hour. And your chances of surviving are really very good. Your chances of being grievously injured are also very good, but your chance of dying are not that high. What was scary is when the sandstorms were blowing in, and then they can't fly. So if you get wounded, you will probably bleed to death before they can help you out. So that was kind of scary stuff. It was just so hot that some, that's a place where there was no air conditioning tents. And it just gets so hot, people just say the heck with it. They sleep outside in the tents. And there's a lot of really bad malaria in that region where we're at, so they have these little tents that they sleep on. And sometimes they just say the heck with it. They don't even sleep in the tent. They just lay on their cot. Getting ready to go on the first patrol that I went on. Uh, Kelly and I have sort of a different memory of, of, the, <laughs> of the war because I was only over there for like a month in the combat zone. She was over there for almost three times that long, but because she was there so long, she actually went on patrols where people didn't try to kill her, but I didn't. I mean, I'm on four foot patrols and three of those we were shot at and, and half a dozen truck patrols, one of which the truck was blown up and all. It's like, so to me, it's like every time I went outside the wire, somebody was trying to kill me. She was lucky enough to go on some patrols where that never happened, but that's going out on patrol. There we go. And again, they, it varies. They, they obviously they don't want the, the Taliban to know when they're coming out, but it's usually before dawn, not always. And like I say, it's like two fire teams. There's ten, five men and four men, and off they go, and that's it. And they send them out a couple times a day, some out at night, and I wasn't about to go at night. I didn't want anything to do with it. But off they go. That's called going outside the wire. And once they, that's Constantine wire there, and once they walk outside that Constantine wire, their life is in great danger. I mean, as soon as they walk outside, that's it. They, you have to understand these bases, not even bases, the outposts are literally surrounded by Taliban. And they just, and the Marines, General McChrystal calls Marja the bleeding ulcer of Marja. And they've been fighting since February of 15th of last year and it's still going on. So it was interesting, we'd be there and we'd hear IEDs going off every day and gun battles and all that. And people said, this is great, you should have been here three months ago. It's like, this is great, my word. So going out on patrol. Typical patrol. You really didn't want to be on the streets because that's where the IEDs. The vast majority of injuries over there are IEDs, IED related. The Marines, because they're so well disciplined, they're so well trained because of the firepower they have, and they also have air support. Oftentimes, in a in a firefight, they're going to win. I mean, it's not that they're not going to get killed because sometimes they do get killed, but they're going to win. But the IEDs are horrific, and they're everywhere. They're just everywhere. That's what scared me. Kelly and I talked about it a lot. If you were still alive after about the first 15 seconds of a firefight, you probably were going to be okay because you could get to cover or wherever. But the IEDs were everywhere. And I hated walking on these dirt roads because they would just blow up and you'd take your legs off. This is Lieutenant Colonel Ellison. He is the Marine that is in charge of all of the Marines and all of Marja and the whole southern part of the Helmut district. He's a pretty incredible guy. I have a lot of respect for the man, and he's incredibly brave, and he was going downtown without any body armor to show the locals that he wasn't afraid, and also the Taliban that he wasn't afraid. He was an incredibly brave guy, and he really knew what he was doing. This is, again, this is Ellison on the left. They're talking to a village elder. They had taken the village elder's cell phone away because they try to find out who's calling who. They have, as soon as you leave the base, you see people, Calvin, I would see these people on their cell phone calling the Taliban, telling them where we were in this direction we were moving, and when they could expect us to stumble through the ambush. And so his cell phone had been taken away and he wants it back, which they gave it to him back. Winning hearts and minds. Um, is this guy a Taliban? No. Are we shaking hands with him? Yeah, you do that. Uh, is he a spotter? Almost undoubtedly. I mean, they know this. The Marines know this. Now, an interesting thing about this, Kelly's uh, talking about seeing women in burqas. This woman is in a burqa, obviously. And we saw one time where three women were walking in the street in burqa. That was the only time I saw women the entire time I was over there. And what's going on here is interesting. This guy's laughing, smiling. Is he Taliban? I don't know. Pretty good chance he is. Does he have a weapon? Most assuredly not. Has she got her weapon? Does she have his weapon under her burqa? Probably. 
And that's why they brought the feds in, because he's not allowed to touch that one. That ring is not. And what's that? Oh, is he? Oh, that's right. I mean, Cynthia and they do it. But they're not allowed to touch it. So that's one of the reasons they brought the feds in, so they could stop that sort of nonsense. That's um, when that first little clip I showed you where I said, watch what happens when he stands up. That's when he stands up. He's running. I'm laying on my side trying to do my job as a journalist and take pictures. I was scared to death, by the way. Um, one of the things they'll tell you is, if you, some of you folks probably been in a firefight, but, but there's different sounds. If you hear a pop, that means somebody's shooting a weapon in your general direction. If you hear a snap, that means the bullet went so close to your ear, you heard it break the sound barriers and went by. And sometimes they also whistle as they go by your ear, which means it's really, really close. And then another bad thing is when you see the dust spots dumping up around your feet, that's a bad thing. And then the worst thing is the thud that you hear right before you fall over dead. There was a lot of snapping going on right here while I was taking this trip. And, and dust spots too. Returning fire, again, setting up, that's a wadi. I mean, they, they sprint to these wadis, they get down and try to figure out what's going on, they return fire, then they get up and just sprint again. And you have to stay with them. Your worst nightmare would be to get separated from the troops. And as Kelly said, the cornfields, I used to be, I hated them because you go in the cornfields and you have to keep a distance about six meters from the guy in front of you and the guy behind you in case somebody throws a hand grenade and doesn't kill all of you. But in those cornfields, they would disappear. And I think if he veers that way and I make a mistake and I veer that way, it's your worst nightmare. I hated it. Searching for the guy who had just been shooting at us. It turned out he was down the road, and they were actually able to shoot him, and he fell into a wadi. But again, there's people all over the place, spotters, and they zip up on these mopeds, and they grab him and zip off and go, so they weren't able to actually apprehend him after they shot him and wounded him. Yeah. Lights are live. Let's get going. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the George S. Turnbull Portland Center. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, this is the uh, Portland base for the university's uh, School of Journalism and Communication. I'm Al Stavitsky, the director of the school, and we're delighted to, uh, to, to see so many folks here for our uh, event this evening embedded in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, we want to issue a, a special greeting to um, members of the uh, World Affairs Council of Oregon who are joining us this evening. You know what? I project well, right? right? I've never been, that has never been a problem of mine as, a, as not being heard. So uh, let me say, we're, we're very pleased to, to uh, be partnering with the World Affairs Council of Oregon for uh, this event. And, uh, and we, we hope to see um, council members back here for, uh, for more of the public events that, that we do here on a, on a regular basis, uh, both here in the Turnbull Center and throughout the uh, the UO in Portland, and there were some flyers uh, uh, by the door of the film series that we do um, with uh, OPB and some of the events that the uh, Lifelong Learning um, Institute has and some of the other programs here as well as the White Box uh, Gallery. So uh, we, uh, we invite you to, uh, to take advantage of, of uh, the many programs that the UO has here in, uh, in Portland, and again, welcome. Uh, in addition to the World Affairs Council, we want to also thank our, our other uh, sponsors, our friends from, uh, from here in the building, the UO Portland Library and Learning Commons, and the, uh, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. Uh, the genesis of this event was uh, last summer when um, Dan Morrison uh, was sitting downstairs in the, uh, in the lobby of the White Stag Block uh, waiting for Callie to come uh, meet him, and they were going to get a ride to go to the airport for Afghanistan. And Dan was surrounded by the bags of uh, body armor and uh, photo gear, and uh, and so of course I had to say, "Can I try on?" I never had body armor on, so you know, while I was putting that on, and uh, uh, I said to Dan, "You know, when you get back, we we got to do an event on this. I mean, we got to share the uh, the experiences uh, that you have." And uh, Dan, being the can-do guy he is, said, absolutely. And then uh, he told Callie that, that she was roped into this, uh, this event as, uh, as well. And, uh, and so here we are uh, uh, these months later. So it's, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dan and, uh, and Callie uh, to you. Uh, and then I'm going to get out of the way here and enjoy this uh, presentation along with you. Uh, Professor Dan Morrison has been a member of the School of Journalism and Communication faculty for six years after a distinguished professional career as a photojournalist that uh, 
took him to more than the 30 countries and the five war zones. He is a leader on our faculty in the transition to multimedia reporting, which uh, you'll, you'll learn more uh, about. And notably here in Portland, uh, Dan led a, a team of student journalists in our digital urban journalism uh, project, which was generously supported by the, uh, the Jackson Foundation. Uh, that project has been uh, reporting on stories and issues in Old Town Chinatown in partnership with the Oregonian. And you can see a gallery of some of the student work in the, uh, in the hallway uh, as, you, um, as you come and go uh, this evening. And uh, we hope to, to have some, uh, some new work on the Oregonian's uh, website uh, later this month uh, from that team. Um, we are also very proud to claim Callie Bagby as an alumna of, uh, of our school, class of 2008. Uh, since then, get this, she has served as a volunteer journalist in Vietnam and Bangladesh for the uh, Prosthetic Outreach Foundation. She spent a year in Iraq as an embedded journalist with Oregon medevac and infantry units. She went on a 1,300-mile bicycle trip through five national parks sending back multimedia reports for Wendy Magazine. Oh, and then there was this summer in, uh, in Afghanistan. So uh, please join me in welcoming uh, to the Turnbull Center, Kelly Bagby and Dan Morrison. Sort of how this is going to work tonight. We're going to show you a couple of very short clips, and then I'm. Uh, am I going first? Or I'm going to still. Kelly goes first. She's going to show you some stills. I can't remember. And then I'm going to show some stills, and then I'm going to show a video she's going to show, and I'm going to show what she's going to show. Them. And then we're going to open up for questions. Okay. And we certainly encourage you to ask us a lot of questions. I will tell you right from the outset. Um, if you're going to ask us the question, are we winning or losing the war, and should we be there? It's not anything to do with what we do. Our whole mission in this thing, Kelly and I talked about this a lot before we went, and we certainly talked about it a lot while we were in the country. Our hope was to bring back to the American people at least a glimpse of what frontline Marine infantry troops go through on a daily basis. If you want to talk about whether we should be in Afghanistan in the first place or whether the war is going well or not, that's a whole different conversation which this evening is not about. Okay? So there's that. I will also tell you, Al did in fact put on my body armor that day, and you're welcome to do it sitting right out there on the table. It only weighs about 65 pounds, and you can put it on. And uh, we, we, we're going to show you something in a second. We wish there was some way, because we really wanted people to get an idea of what it's like to be there. It's not possible. It's 125 degrees for one thing. Uh, there's a lot of dust, and it's just, and, and people are shooting at you. You can play all the video games in the world you want, and watch all the war movies you want. It's just not the same. But we are going to try to show you at least, give you sort of a glimpse of what these people are. So having said that, one of the things that people always, and we have a lot of stories to tell, but we have to keep it relatively brief to them. But one of the things people always say is like, what is it like to be under fire? Um, I was there six weeks, but it takes about a week to get in and about a week to get out. So the truth of the matter is, I was actually in the combat area for about a month. Uh, Callie was there in almost two and a half months because she stayed an additional six weeks and she was at the front line. She went places I didn't even want to go. Um, but it, just a quick set of how this comes, it's an enormously difficult process to get permission to go as an embed. It took us about four months of constant emails and paperwork and back and forth and all that. And even though they're not here, a shout out to the folks at KVAL who gave us credentials to go. Um, but you have to actually be invited by a unit commander to go. And if you don't know a unit commander, they have to find someone who will invite you if you don't go. So it's an enormously difficult process. And the nut of all that is, right before we left, two things happened that had a lot of impact on what we were doing. One was a Rolling Stone article came out by Michael Hastings, which got um, General McChrystal relieved of duty, and I thought, wow, 
I came in like two weeks before we were supposed to leave, and we got an email. I got an email. Kelly was actually on that bicycle trip while this was going on, so we were trying to buy body armor and everything via email while she was riding a bike. So they didn't have the color khaki in. <laughs> <laughs> so they wouldn't you sell have to call us. another yeah. place with the commander saying you have to have khaki yeah. body armor. But we got an email when that article, Lone Star article came out, and they said, that's it, you're not coming out of it. And it's like, wow, and we already bought $4,000 worth of gear. The body armor itself cost $1,200. The helmet's another three fifty, dollars et cetera. It just it piles up. We had both purchased non-refundable round trip tickets, which are about two grand each. And so we're like, wow, we can't go. So a lot of furious emailing back and forth, and we finally got permission again to go. And what had happened was a friend of a friend, the retired Marine officer in Eugene, had set us up with a guy he knew. And I had spent many, many emails over the course of a couple of months getting to know him to where eventually he said, okay, you guys can come embed in our unit. And four days, literally four days before we were supposed to fly, he got transferred to a different place. Like, oh, and then we had no place to go. So when Cal and I flew out of PDX, to actually Kuwait's how we went in, which is sort of a strange way to do it. We had no idea where we were going. They sent us to a place called Camp Leatherneck, which is the largest Marine Corps base in the country. We specifically requested Helmand Province because we knew that was where most of the <coughs> fighting was taking place. We went to Camp Leatherneck, which is a city. I mean, it really is a city. And we thought, well, not much going on here. And and then they came a couple of days later and they said, we're going to send you down to another base called Dwyer, which people said, ooh, Mark Dwyer. And so we, we went there for a couple of days and was like, well, there was stuff going on there, but not much. And then a couple of days later, they said, we're going to send you to Marja. And people said, ooh, no, not Marja. And Kelly and I both knew at the time that Marja was the hottest, uh, most dangerous place in all of Afghanistan. That's shifted a little bit right now because they're in the Sands of Valley fighting. But when we were there, it was the most dangerous place in the entire country. So that's where we went. And then we got to the to Marja and they said, do you want to, after we were there for a few days, they asked us if we wanted to go out to the frontline units, which is the people who go out and patrol every day, and we said yes. So they sent us there, and then while we were there, they said, do you want to go even to a smaller outpost, and we said yes. And Cal and I used to joke that eventually they were going to stick us in a foxhole with one Marine, and, and before Cal <laughs> left, it really almost happened to her. She actually went on patrol with basically one Marine, it's like the craziest thing I've ever heard. Well, that's a little bit more than story. Not much. <laughs> but in any case, people always say, well, what's it like? Well, it's just, I mean, you try to imagine that body in which weighs 50, 60 pounds, depending on how you have it geared. You got your helmet, your camera, and all that. It is 125 degrees. It is so hot, it is just unbearable. You feel like your brain is cooking, and you're running across the field sprinting while the person on the machine gun is shooting at you trying to kill you. Is that what it's, that's, that's what it's like. And it's not every time you go out, but almost every time you go out. So, a couple minutes of that, just so you know. That's all what, uh, there, that's in case you don't know. Hey, that's where we were. Right here. I have to go here on the phone. No, just the phone. Thank you.
Make sure ain't nobody in here. Go, me up there too, babe. That you know that there's actually, for those of you who've been in the military, you know this, but it's always surprising to people who've never been in the military, there are rules to how you fight wars. This is this is this new set of rules that they're fighting the Afghanistan war. This was written by Petraeus. This is the account of Surgeon's Humanity. And if you have a question on what you should do, it's in here. Okay. It's also very important, you know, they're trying to learn from some of the mistakes, not only from Vietnam, especially, but also the mistakes they made in Iraq. The rules of engagement are such that the reason the Marines run directly into the to the ambush is directly into it, because that's the safest thing to do in an ambush in any case, but they try to get there before the Taliban leave. The rules of engagement are, unless the person has a weapon in his hand, you're not allowed to shoot. So the Taliban who will shoot, and as soon as the Marines get close enough, they'll lay their weapon down and they just walk off into the crowd. And since they no longer have a weapon, you're not allowed to shoot. Okay, That's the rules of engagement. It's called winning hearts and minds. I find it a bit odd, but that is what the rules they live by. Unless they, I mean, if they see the guy shooting him and then they see him walk away, then they could. But oftentimes they certainly don't see him. He's behind the wall. And unless they can, what's called positive on deep, unless they get hit on him, what they call it, they, they, they're not allowed to take him in or anything else. And they sprint there. They hope to sprint there and cut him off before they can melt away into the, to the, the local region. So that's the one reason they sprint. I will tell you, again, I really thought, I had been in combat patrols before. I thought we would go out with 20, 30, 40 people. You go out with four people. On the fire team. Cal, Cal and I were sometimes, not always, but sometimes we're on patrols together, but she was way over there and I was way over here. And that's it. It's you and four guys walking across the field until you get shot at and then you sprint. And Cal and I were talking about, well, you don't want to be behind the first guy because if he's a point man, they're going to try to kill him. And you certainly don't want to be behind the last guy because they'll ambush him with the fine. And the guy in the middle is carrying the light on him and the machine gun, so you don't want to be near him. It's like there is no safe place to be. That's what and they do. On one patrol that I went on, they told one of the journalists, I was with some other journalists, and they told her not to stand in front of the Afghan national soldiers because they might accidentally shoot her, or shoot who's in front of them because they're not, you know, their training isn't across the board. You might have someone that's really well trained and someone that's not. So that's another thing that you have to think about. If there's an a and behind you, uh, maybe that's not the best situation. And the other thing is, I assume most of you people know this, but some of the Marines were surprised by this. No, we did not carry a weapon. No, we were not allowed to touch a weapon. It was against the Geneva Convention for Germans to touch a weapon in a war zone. So we were unarmed the entire time. And the truth of the matter is, once we got certainly past Fog Mars, you, once you left what's called leaving the wire, you were in, everybody out there wants to kill you. And your absolute worst nightmare would be separated from the troops and be captured. You would, you would die a very horrible death. But you're not armed. And, and we, there were, We'll come up later, but there were times like that. We get if we get overrun and we're alive, what do we do? Okay. So with that. That's me. Um, so to give you some background, I three months after I graduated from the University of Oregon, I was invited by a friend of mine who was the commander of the medevac unit out of Salem, Oregon, to go to Iraq for a year. Um, and he wanted me to go not for six months, but for a year, or not at all. So I decided to take that um, offer, and I went for a year, and during that time, Dan had been my professor while I was in school at the University of Oregon, and then he kind of became my mentor because he had done combat journalism, and so we really, I called him more than I called my parents, because I was constantly needing, you know, to ask someone questions, and, you know, it was my first job out of college. And in December, I got a... It's a tough internship. <laughs> There are no internships in Afghanistan. Someone asked me that the other day, just to clarify, that I know of student internships. Um, so in December, Dan sent me an email and he said, you know, I really, I want to go to Afghanistan. I'm going to start working on it. And although he didn't ask me, I wrote him back and said, there is no way that I'm going back to the desert. And, you know, I just, I wanted to get out of the Middle East. Um, but I told him that I knew myself that probably in six months I would change my mind. And within probably three weeks of being home, I decided to start going through this process. And, you know, it's been an amazing experience. 
to go to Afghanistan with someone who's been your mentor and now is your colleague and to watch them work. So for me, that was just incredible. And you know, the guys always thought it was funny that you know they're like, is he your dad or your boss? <laughs> and I say, well, no. Grandfather. But he was my professor at the University of Oregon. So. No, but there, were, there really was a time when I was in the truck and they couldn't see me and she was over there and people were talking about it. And I leaned over and said, that's my car. And they were like, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> 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 but, um, so we had a really great time going and, um, you know, representing the University of Oregon, which has been really great to throw this event in to support us um, while we were there. And then before she launches into it, because I'll have to forget this, I will say that it, one of the most rewarding things of being a teacher is when you have a student <coughs> who becomes your teacher and your master, especially within two years, which I didn't think that would happen. But because Kelly had been in Iraq for a year, when we went to Afghanistan, I was in the position of saying, what do we do now? I mean, I, I'm, I've never done this. I, you know, I've been in wars with them. What the heck do we do now? And for two years out of school to have a student <coughs> who accomplished as much as she did, it was just astounding. It, was, it just was so rewarding. And yes, we want to choke each other to death sometimes, but, but, but it really was just like, you know, I see her working out there and think, oh my gosh, how does she do that? How can I go on? So like Dan said before, um, you know, we want to try to give you the experience of what we had over there, and, and the best way to do it is through images. This is um, one of the first firefights that I was in, First, one of the first patrols. Um, <coughs> And all the you know different areas that are in the landscape varies. Um, this is a picture of a marine going through a cornfield, which I always felt great in the cornfield as far as being camouflaged. Dan <coughs> felt differently, but um, so you know, but you're walking through these huge cornfields, and because of the irrigation, they're in like the 40s and 50s. USAID built irrigation ditches there, so there are a lot of the areas that are farming. There is greenery, there is vegetation in the desert. Same uh, Marine later on that patrol. Um, this is after um, we'd received contact, so there had been shots fired from the north or south, whatever direction it was. So there had been shots fired, and um, so all the Marines dropped down, and then they told me to run. So we were all running across this field to basically a mud berm. And so we're all sitting on this berm. You know, he's wiping the sweat out of his eyes, which is one of the worst things for me out there is you get so, you know, sweaty, you're running, and you can't see anything, and then you wipe your eyes, and your hands are covered in dirt. Um, <clears throat> and also at this point, he was, he's asked, you know, this is in the middle of the firefight, and he's asking me, what's your name again? And I said, Callie, and he's like, oh, isn't that the doctor from Grey's Anatomy? You know, I think it's, you're probably going to laugh at me that I'm watching this, my girlfriend watched it. And I'm thinking, this is like, you know, we're getting shots again, and he takes off and runs, and I'm thinking this, because, you know, you see that in the movies, and you think, oh, that's, you know, totally fake, but, you know, we both had experiences where these random conversations would happen, and, you know, what I was thinking about, i got to get the shot, or where are the Taliban shooting from, and a little great anatomy conversation. <laughs> so after um, we received this gunfire, um, you know, like Dan said, they're running towards the gunfire to see if they can make contact with the enemy. Um, and in a lot of cases, they would refer the Taliban as ghosts because once they would get to the area where the firefight was coming from, they would be gone. And in this case, they found um, bullet casings from, or shells from the bullets. And that was the only evidence they had that there had been Taliban shooting there. But they do go through the doors and they'll go into all these compounds, which are little mud buildings. And so this is just a picture of a Marine, um, you know, telling these guys it's okay, they're gonna search this compound. And this is another Marine who's trying to get the ANA, which is the Afghan National Army soldier to come in. The ANA are required to go in first um, into the compound before the Marines can. In this incident, in this day, the ANA soldier did not want to go into the building. So every door we had to stop in for like five minutes, and the Marines would have to, you know, start almost physically pushing him in because he was so um, terrified. <coughs> this is inside a mud building. One of the Marines, um, they found pieces of paper, and the ANA soldier believed that there were incriminating words on the piece of paper. I think it was like RPG and IED. 
So <clears throat> they took the person into custody and they told us to be careful not to call. He was a person of interest versus a detainee. A detainee is only when they have real solid evidence and they're gonna take a person in. A person of interest is someone they're just going to further question. So as soon as that person was um, taken into custody and they were, we were heading back to the base, uh, a bunch of the guys saw some of the helicopters were flying off from a medevac mission and they said whenever helicopters leave the air, the Taliban will start shooting again because they know there's no longer air support. Um, so then right away we start getting shots again in our direction and they run back into this compound and they're convinced that the Taliban are in this building. So I go in there and you know we hear all this gunfire um, from, the, from the guys that had gone in first. So we run in and they were just firing a lock off because they couldn't get a lock off the door. There were no Taliban there. And you know, this is basically what I saw. It's like the dust, you know, there's this gun, gun shuts going off and there's just this fog. And so that's kind of my, what I saw when I was in there. This is another um, patrol that I was on, the second firefight that I was in. Um, this one lasted about 20 minutes, um, which seems like several hours go by in that 20 minute span. Um, so as you can see here, you can kind of see there's water. This is one of the irrigation ditches that was filled with water. So what happened was we we're on the patrol, we started getting, taking contact, taking fire from the enemy. So we start running in that direction. We get to the wadi and you have to go in the wadi um, to take cover. He decided to stay above the water. Um, so there's another picture of that Marine um, shooting at the enemy. You can see, you know, one of the things about the wet wadis is you're taking cover from the firefight, you're, you know, for like five minutes or two minutes, you're getting soaked, and then you have to run across these huge fields. On this day, we ran about 300 meters, and you're running over terrain that is this dry dirt and it's little divots in it. And they just, the Marines just jump from one divot to the next. And so <coughs> as journalists, you know, one of our biggest fears is to keep up with them. And, um, you know, so that, and the next field after that had like cotton. So there was all these vines coming up from the cotton. And just, you just have to um, run with them. This is a photo of a Marine um, taken after they were able to get close enough to the shooters to um, get a positive identification that they were actually holding weapons and shooting and they were able to shoot one of the Taliban. And all this will be in a video later too. One of the things I got to do early on was spend four hours with the corpsman, who's basically the medic for the unit. And the man on the right with the lollipop in his mouth, um, he had been up that day since five in the morning. He worked from five to noon and he had patients coming in all day. The majority of his patients were small children that get you know, a cut or something and then they're swimming in this dirty water. They don't have medical care, so these little cuts would have these huge sores and really terrible infected wounds. Uh, this picture is taken of a man that someone brought in on a truck and so the medics actually ran outside of the base, which they're not supposed to do, and grabbed him and took him in because he was unconscious. This is a photo of a father of one of the patients. He had, his son had a bloody nose, and so he put tissue up his nose, and it got left there for, pieces of it got left for over a month, and so it was just horribly infected. So he brought his son in to have them look at it. This is one of the female Marines from the female engagement team. And the female engagement team is a new thing that they've been doing where they'll have, um, in, where we were, they had two females assigned to a company, so about 100 men, and um, they do go on patrols, they do carry weapons. A lot of the stuff that they're doing is interacting with the women, because in a lot of cases, the Afghan women can have no interaction with the male Marines. Um, they do some um, searching and security as far as, you know, if there's a, I was on some patrols where there'd be a female Afghan woman wearing, you know, burqa or something similar to a burqa, and the females um, can can check those women without offending their culture. So the story behind this photo is she had the tattoo of forever, um, when she was dating her previous boyfriend, and he also had the forever tattoo. 
And then when they broke up, she got nothing left. <laughs> tattoo. Um, and she told me that her boyfriend had also the same tattoo, and his solution was to break his arm so that he would have a scar through forever. So he was also a Marine. So they're pretty sad. Um, this is another, this is actually a corpsman, not part of the female engagement team, but they flew her down to Marja for one day because they really needed to get into this female Afghan doctor's home and check out because the Marines were funding um, this female doctor, but they needed to assess the clinic. And the husband of the doctor said, you know, the male Marines, they cannot come here. We don't want any males here. So they had to fly in a medic and a female doctor from a larger base. And I was also allowed to go in. And so the three of us were able to go in and look at the clinic and talk to the female doctor. I don't have any pictures with her though because they asked, um, almost all the female Afghan women I met, they asked me not to take their picture. Or more their husbands or brothers or sons asked me for them not to take their picture. This is another um, female Marine on patrol from the female engagement team. This is a young Afghan girl. Uh, on a lot of the patrols that I went on, especially after I'd been there for a long time, and. Um, towards the middle of September, things were fairly quiet for a while, and you would see kids, um, a lot of times, um, not as many female children, um, and you would rarely, I think the whole time that we were there, we saw maybe three adult females, Afghan females, um, and occasionally you'd see female girls. Sometimes, I mean, I thought most of the time when we saw kids, it meant that it was gonna be a relatively safe day. I know a lot of the Marines said that that wasn't true, and that the Taliban did not care and that they, there would be firefights and IEDs when there were kids around. This is another Afghan uh, child, well, child, probably 10, uh, young man, but he, uh, he was employed by the Marines at a base to pick up trash and do that kind of stuff. Uh, this is an Afghan man who was working as a contractor for the Marines, and the Marines would pay him to go clean irrigation canals. And on one of the days that he was out cleaning, <clears throat> some men approached him and told him that they would harm him if he continued to work with the American military. He said that he was gonna continue working and he was stabbed uh, three times and somehow didn't hit any critical <coughs> arteries and he was fine. When Dan and I interviewed him, he said that as soon as his wounds were healed, he was gonna continue working as a contractor for the Marines and he says, um, the Taliban is my enemy and I am their enemy. This is um, a photo of a Marine and one of the elders from a village. And this is just showing that um, one thing the Marines are really trying to do is get, uh, to show that they're culturally sensitive. So during Ramadan, which is the Muslim religious observa observance, the Marines were told not to drink water in front of the locals, even on like four hour patrols in 120 degree weather because um, the Muslim culture was fasting. So that was something that they really truly did work on. This is a Marine um, during one patrol uh, and he's watching as this conversation ensues between a Marine and one of the locals. And he was trying to get the local to show him where the elder of the area lived. And basically the conversation went like, the local man said, I'm not going to help you. You can do whatever you want. I won't help you. And the Marine trying to get him to help him, uh, which is something that happens a lot. And, and I saw a lot of the time that I was there, these conversations that were very circular and would go on and the Marines would get frustrated. And sometimes the locals really you know, were just adamant they weren't they did not want to be involved with the Marines. They did not want to be seen being involved with the Marines. Um, if, if they did work with them, a lot of times they wanted it to be uh, away from the village, not something where everyone was going to see what they were doing. On that day that we were looking for this elder's house, um, there was a firefight. And during the firefight, they pulled out four individuals, four young men that they thought looked like the people that had been shooting at the Marines. And they brought them over and took their cell phones, and we're gonna later check to see if there's anything suspicious on their cell phones. And then later um, they found hash on them, these little bags. And so the, the Marines that were talking to these four Afghan men were saying, well, 
you know, do you have any brothers, kid brothers, kid sisters? I mean, how would you feel if they were doing drugs? And they gave them this lecture on, um, you know, safety and don't do drugs. And then they gave them the hash, took the cell phones, and let them go. <laughs> this young man came to one of the um, combat outposts, which is um, towards the front line, a smaller uh, base with probably only a or so Marines. This was on the last day of Ramadan, so it was during Eid, which is the celebration day after the month-long observance of fasting. And he had woken up that morning, sent his kid, three kid brothers out into the field, and they were hit by an IED. Uh, one of the brothers died on impact, and the other two he took to the base to get medical treatment. Um, and one of the female Marines was actually the one that dealt with him. And one of the things, I mean, they're usually, from what I heard, they're never IEDs in a field. So that was one of the confusing points that had it been in a field, that's just something that doesn't happen very often. And these are his, him on the right, and escorting his two brothers to higher levels of medical care. This is um, Lance Corporal Gil Frazier, um, another Marine that I spent some time with. And this is on a patrol where, again, they had persons of interest, two guys that looked suspicious during a firefight. Um, he's questioning the young men, and he keeps asking them, you know, why were you out in this area during a firefight? That, you know, that doesn't make sense to me. And the guy is saying, well, I wanted to go to my uncle's house. And he's saying, well, why did you do it during the firefight? And he says, well, because I wanted to get there. And, um, you know, and that's the thing, like, you do see people, usually people will leave the area during a firefight if it's in the area. But because it's so common there, for a lot of people, it is just part of their daily routine. That if they need to get to their uncle's house, the firefight isn't necessarily going to stop them. Could he have been a spotter? And by spotter, I mean someone that's on their cell phone calling the Taliban, letting them know the marine location. He could have been, but also it's very likely that he really just needed to get to his uncle's. So <clears throat> those um, young men were brought into the base, and um, they were there at the base for further questioning for about five minutes, because the captain of that base had made a deal with the local elders that if they came in and vouched for any persons of interest, that they would be released immediately. So they brought them in and released. This is a picture of one of the first voters um, for the parliamentary elections in mid-September in Marja. Um, they had a few voters in the morning, but it really tapered off during the middle of the afternoon because there were firefights, basically three or four firefights going on surrounding the area of the polling sites. And there were RPGs coming over the polling site, which is a school. And so the colonel of the battalion that were with really hoped for um, a big turnout, but in almost everywhere in Afghanistan there were firefights, the Taliban were really making a move to make sure the elections didn't go well. During um, during that day, we, they had some intel that the base was gonna get attacked, which I told everyone that it was not gonna get attacked because what's the likelihood of that happening? Uh, but they, an RPG was launched into the base. It hit a tent where there were two Marines in the tent. No one was wounded, but they told us all that we had to put our Kevlar on our helmets and go into a bunker. And we were in this bunker for four hours, which everyone thought was very amusing because there was no cover on the bunker. So it's a wide open cover <laughs> on this huge concrete bunker. This is a Marine at the end of a patrol. Um, some of the patrols go four hours, some of them go eight hours, some of them leave five in the morning, um, some of them end in the middle of the afternoon, and some of them end um, at night. I was on a few that ended really late at night, which wasn't my favorite time of day to go on patrol. Um, but it was really beautiful as the sun was up. This is an EOD technician, which is an explosive ordnance disposal um, technician. So like if anyone's seen the Hurt Locker, the bomb squad guys, uh, Dan and I went out with him while he was rendering an IED safe and then detonating it. This is another day out with the IED guys. Um, he's basically, you know, they have, um, they'll have a line of trucks and those guys will be performing security outside and inside and watching what's going on. So this is basically what he's watching. This is um, Staff Sergeant Hernandez. 
So he's right there, there's an IED in there, and he's working on it. And it was about a half an hour of us, you know, the guys pulling security, but then you're just watching him work on this IED. And it's, I was about ready to pull my hair out just because, you know, he's right there, you know the IED, you don't know exactly what he's doing. Um, luckily, they were able to take the IED out. Um, and at, at this point, he's rendered it safe. So they're able to approach it, look at, look at it, and then um, Hernandez will take it into the field and they'll do what's called a controlled detonation. And I also have a video of that too. During that day where we did the IED sweep, so basically before they found the IED, we were walking for, I think that day, up to seven hours on these dirt roads and basically looking for IEDs. And during that, so what I said at the time was like the only thing worse than being out here looking for IDs is getting in a firefight, and then a firefight starts about a half mile away. So you know, during we're wondering is it going to come this way, you know, and, and so it's it's very chaotic. It's not chaotic for the guys because they know who's pulling security and who's working on finding the IDs, and they don't deviate from that. Um, so the firefight was happening at this base, which is a really really small mid base where you could see all sides of it, and an RPG. Well, there was a, a guy sitting on the post. And so he's standing up on this wall, just like this guy, and he's scanning the area, and he sees a guy with an RPG, which is, you know, a missile that he's gonna launch. So he jumps off, and the RPG hits the wall, shoots rocks out, knocks the guy down onto the ground, and, you know, this is the hole from the RPG. The guy gets back right on, starts doing security again. Later in the day, a medic comes and says, you know, you probably have a class one concussion. I interview the guy, and he says, no, I had a headache, I feel dizzy, but I smoked a cigar, and I'm good to go. <laughs> so that's, that's the Marine here all there. This is an Oregon Reservist Marine who's in the gunner position, which is on top of the vehicle. There's a little turret, and that's where they're doing security. Um, he would spend, you know, the, before this picture was taken, he was out for a month, where he and three other guys will take turns manning the gun. One will sleep. The other one will be up there for five to six hours, and we'll just go 24 hours doing security. Um, in this case, they were doing security for engineers, combat engineers. They were doing road construction, so and they work at night. So these guys, someone has to be up 24 hours a day, and they usually have the driver will be up, and then the gunner will be up, and someone will take a nap, and they just rotate. They get out of the trucks very little in that month. I mean, they're living inside the trucks. They're living with their armor on every day. And that, for me, I did that for five days, and that was the roughest. I thought it wasn't even gonna last for five days just because there's no, you're just in the desert, there's nothing there. There's nothing there. There are no bathrooms. There's no food outside of the plastic bag. So it, um, that was the, the roughest living conditions. And luckily it was, it was safe um, for the most part. There were um, a lot of IEDs in the area later on, but um, This is, so <clears throat> Dan and I went on a patrol at one in the afternoon, and it was a foot patrol, and so we were getting ready to go on this foot patrol, and the captain says, well, do you wanna, someone's driving there, so do you wanna drive there? And I say, well, no, and Dan goes, well, whatever Callie wants. And I said, well, I think we should walk, well, whatever Callie wants. I was hoping so, she would say, let's ride the truck. <laughs> so I thought it would be a really great experience to go on a four hour patrol at one in the afternoon, in like, I had to be like 120. They kept saying it was 90 something, which I don't know why someone would lie about that. But, <laughs> um, so like, we're on this patrol, you know, I wanted to go, but after even the first hour, I'm feeling like, it is so hot and sweat, and you're jumping over these berms and these wadis, and these big, you know, strong guys are just like leaping around, and I'm, you know, trying to keep up with them. And, you know, thoughts of my own self-misery were going on, but the guy next to me was this guy. So you can't really see it, but the backpack on his back, adding with his gun and everything, is about 90 pounds of weight. And on top of that, he is, they choose that he's gonna have to pull security for me. So he's now in charge of this civilian journalist who's gonna ask him questions. And, which I don't know how he got that job, but, and, and you go out there and you know that these guys will take a bullet for you, no question. If it came down to it, they're gonna do their job, they're gonna have security for you. And then on top of that, he's telling me that he just got shot in the arm three weeks ago, and that they wanted to keep him and send him to Germany, but 
didn't want to. All I wanted to do was get back on patrol. So four hours later, I am, you know, feeling really tired. Like I've got my weight uh, of gear, and it's so hot. And it's like you cannot complain when you're walking next to this guy. You know, I mean, there's just no way to feel sorry for yourself. And if you do, then you just feel horribly guilty. So um, he was just one of the people that I met, and I'm like, I just can't believe, I can't believe they wouldn't make you go home. And there was another guy in the unit that had been shot three times, and he demanded to come back, and they wouldn't let him go on patrols anymore, but he was allowed to stay on the base. And almost, I met three or four guys that had been seriously injured, and they all fought so hard to get back to their unit. That's all they cared about. <clears throat> this is um, one of the memorials I went to. There were three memorial services held in one day because a unit had had three of their Marines killed in action or three days. This is for Lance Corporal Cody Childers. And what they do for the memorial is they'll have boots, um, the rifle, dog tags, and the helmet to symbolize the fallen Marine, and the um, Marine Corps flag and the US flag. And um, I had never been to a military memorial service of any kind. And the one here, it was very much like a funeral. They had the chaplain talk, and they also gave an opportunity for the friends of the fallen to give their own testimonials. Um, and to give, I mean, the thing that it gave those Marines that were there that one hour to grieve, to actually experience that loss in a small way. Because most of the time that you're there, you really don't have time to dwell what's going on. You don't have time to grieve. You don't have time to, you know, really feel things. So this gave them kind of a small window to do that. And <clears throat> what the Marines would do is they'd put their, um, they gave, at the end, opportunity for the Marines to come and salute the boots and the Kevlar and to say their own personal goodbyes. And this young man's putting his hand on the boot. Um, and typically, they would kiss the dog tag uh, and say goodbye like that. <coughs> um, a couple of things that you're coming through, coming in here, sort of the foyer. Of the, one of the things we have laid out on the table is MREs and these things that look like little sandwich bags. Um, and there's some chewing tobacco out there, and there's some Red Bull. Uh, the reason that's out there is because people say, well, well what's it like? Well, for one thing, when we got, we eventually got to a compound that was half the size of this room. And there were 10 men in there, and they had been there for 29 days. And they were in the middle of nowhere, surrounded. And, and we said, yeah, isn't that the place we were going to? And I said, please come and tell me about the truck. It was so hot. Uh, but we talked to them, and they said, well, how do you sleep at night? I mean, you're surrounded by the Taliban. And they, they would get in a circle, and so no matter which way the Taliban would try to go over the walls, they could shoot in all directions. 29 days. How they do this stuff is just beyond me. But, but the, the daily routine, it's like, well, what's it like? Well, for one thing, uh, they shower maybe once a week, maybe once every two weeks, whatever. They still shave all the shower. They still shave all the time because they're still Marines. But there's no restrooms, so they defecate in those plastic bags we have out on the table, and you throw it in a burn pit. There's a burn pit in every base that burns 24 hours a day, and all the garbage, including human waste, is being burned. And so the base smells like diesel, because all these giant trucks run on diesel and burning waste and, and all this stuff. And the other thing is, because they're trying to win hearts and lives, they are, I mean, the Marines are very strict about not doing anything that will offend the locals. So there is, there's no alcohol at all, and there's, there's never any drugs in the Marine Corps. Uh, but there's, there's not, there's not supposed to be. So, but the interesting thing over there as well is that the traditional things, at the very least, you know, the pinup girls on the came on the front noses of the bombers and what no. You know, girly magazines, no, not at all, no. Um, so, in fact, I got a Marine in trouble because I took a picture, he was in his, in his machine gun turret, and there was a picture of a woman in a bikini. Wasn't talking to him in a bikini, but he got in trouble when they saw that he had stuck that on his turret. So that might be offensive to the local folks. Okay, so that's, that's what it's like. I mean, they go out on patrol, they risk their life every day, but sometimes four hours, sometimes eight hours, depending on the down, and they come back to absolutely nothing. There's nothing to do. Uh, the, the group that I was that I like to hang around with the most, and Kelly got the deep pretty good buzz too, called Cat Five. They would try to amuse themselves by having contests to see who could drink the most water before they would vomit. <laughs> and they would, oh, I think the bet was seven leaves. I think I won five bucks on that bet or whatever. But, and, and they would see how many caffeine pills they gave before they would throw up. I mean, so there's nothing to do. In this picture, because my wife loved it, my lovely wife is not here, although that's my son over there. Where's my son? There he is, back there. 
Yeah, I think that is one of the corniest, most macho looking things ever. But it's a picture of me. It just came off parole. Uh, patrol. Or parole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just came off patrol. Um, I'm old. I'm 58. But I was in the Marine Corps from 70 to 74. And so I was older than the lieutenant colonel, and I was older than everybody. And these people would come up, the word got out, and they would come up kind of shy, and they would say, where were you at? I said, I fought with General Lee at Gettysburg. And they go, no, that's not possible. <laughs> this is a typical tent. Now, some of the bases, some of the larger bases, by the way, a FOB is forward operating base. A camp is a big place. A FOB, which is marginal where we're at, that's where commanders are and all that stuff. Colonels and people like that and all kinds of classified stuff that we saw that we're not supposed to talk about. Um, and then you go from a FOB out to a COP, which is a combat outpost, and then you go out to just an outpost, outpost, then you go to sometimes just these little drawn off little things. But it's some of the FOBs, some of these things are actually air conditioned, believe it or not. They have these giant generators that some of these tents are actually air conditioned. But that's it, there's about 18 men, and they don't shower, and they burp and fart, and that's what they do all the time. And if you notice too, by the way, everybody has a body armor right there, because that we were actually attacked here. We were attacked a couple times in the base, and you need to be able to, in total darkness, reach over, grab it, and put it on the gear. Typical day. I mean, it's called moon dust over there. It just gets in everything. So, and somebody was laughing, saying, you know that the journalist doesn't know what they're doing in Afghanistan. They're trying to keep your cameras clean. It's impossible. It's just futile, so don't even bother. It's just brutal on the camera. But one of the reasons I have a camera hanging off my body mark is because that's the one I dropped in the water and destroyed it. Three thousand dollar camera. Wow. I mean, it's brutal over there on gear. Filling sandbags. I think Marines have been doing this since the Marine Corps was founded in 1775. Can they just do it for the hell of it? How do I get another dude today when it fills the sandbags? So, actually, that's a sandstorm. A sandstorm is real scary because when the sandstorms blow in, that one was a three day long sandstorm, the helicopters can't fly. So, if you get wounded, they have what's called the golden hour. If you get wounded, a helicopter medevac will probably be there within 10 to 15 minutes and have you back in medical base within about the same amount of time, certainly within an hour. And your chances of surviving are really very good. Your chances of being grievously injured are also very good, but your chances of dying are not that high. What was scary is when the sandstorms were blowing in, and then they can't fly. So if you get wounded, you will probably bleed to death before they can help you out. So that was kind of scary stuff. It was just so hot that some, that's a place where there was no air conditioning tents. And it just gets so hot, people just say the heck with it, and they sleep outside in the tents. And there's a lot of really bad malaria in that region where we're at, so they have these little tents that they sleep on. And sometimes they just say the heck with it, don't even sleep in the tent, they just lay on the Getting ready to go on the first patrol that I went on. Uh, Kelly and I have sort of a different memory of, of, the, <laughs> of the war because I was only over there for like a month in the combat zone. She was over there for almost three times that long, but because she was there so long, she actually went on patrols where people didn't try to kill her, but I didn't. I mean, I went on four foot patrols and three of those we were shot at and, and half a dozen truck patrols, one of which the truck was blown up and all. It's like, so to me, it's like every time I went outside, why are somebody trying to kill me? She was lucky enough to go on some patrols where that never happened, but that's going out on the patrol. There we go. And, and again, they, it varies. They, they obviously they don't want the, the Taliban to know when they're coming out, but it's usually before dawn, not always. And like I say, it's like two fire teams. There's ten, five men and four men, and off they go, and that's it. And they send them out a couple times a day, send them out at night, and I wouldn't survive to go at night. I didn't know anything to do with it. But off they go. That's called going outside the wire. And once they, that's Constantino wire there, and once they walk outside that Constantino wire, their life is in great danger. I mean, as soon as they walk outside, that's it. They, you have to understand these bases, not these bases, the outposts are literally surrounded by Taliban. And they just, and the Marines, General McChrystal calls Marja the bleeding also of Marja. They've been fighting since February of 15th of last year, and it's still going on. So it was interesting, we'd be there, and we'd hear IEDs going off every day, and gun battles and all that, and people said, this is great, should have been here three months ago. It's like, this is great, my word. So, Going out on patrol, just a typical patrol. You really didn't want to be on the streets because that's where the IEDs, the vast majority of injuries over there are IEDs, IED related. The Marines, because they're so well disciplined, they're so well trained because of the firepower they have, and they also have air support oftentimes. In a, in a firefight, they're gonna win. I mean, it's not that they're not gonna get killed because sometimes they do get killed, but they're gonna win. But the IEDs are horrific and they're everywhere. They're just everywhere. That's what scared me. Kelly and I talked about a lot. If you were still alive after about the first 15 seconds of a firefight, you probably were gonna be okay. 
because you could get the cover or wherever. But the IEDs were everywhere. I hated walking on these dirt roads because they would just blow up and you'd take your legs off. This is Lieutenant Colonel Ellison. He is the Marine that is in charge of all of the Marines and all of Marja and the whole southern part of the district. He's a pretty incredible guy. I have a lot of respect for the man, and he's incredibly brave, and he was going downtown without any body armor to show the locals that he wasn't afraid, and also the Taliban that he wasn't afraid. He was an incredibly brave guy, and he really knew what he was doing. This is, again, this is Ellison on the left. They're talking to a village elder. They had taken the village elder's cell phone away, because they try to find out who's calling who. They have, as soon as you leave the base, you see people counting out and see these people on their cell phone, calling the Taliban, telling them where we were, which direction we were moving, and when they could expect us to stumble through the ambush. And so his cell phone had been taken away, and he wants it back, which they gave it to him back. Within hearts and minds, um, is this guy a Taliban? Probably. Are we shaking hands with him? Yeah, you do that. Uh, is he a spotter? Almost undoubtedly. I mean, they know this. The Marines know this. Now, an interesting thing about this, Cal uh, Cal was talking about seeing women in burqas. This woman is in a burqa, obviously. And we saw one time where three women were walking in the street in burqa. That was the only time I saw women the entire time I was over there. And what's going on here is interesting. This guy's laughing, smiling. Is he Taliban? I don't know. Pretty good chance he is. Does he have a weapon? Most assuredly not. Has she got her weapon? Does she have his weapon under her burqa? Probably. And that's why they brought the feds in, because he's not allowed to touch that woman. That ring is not. And what's that? Oh, is he? Oh, that's right. He didn't send any soldier. But they're not allowed to touch him. So that's one of the reasons they brought the feds in, so they could stop that sort of nonsense. That's um, when that first little clip I showed you where I said, watch what happens when he stands up. That's when he stands up. He's running. I'm laying on my side and do my job as a journalist and take pictures. I was scared to death, by the way. Um, one of the things they'll tell you is, if you, some of you folks have probably been in a firefight, but, but there's different sounds. If you hear a pop, that means somebody's shooting a weapon in your general direction. If you hear a snap, that means the bullet went so close to your ear, you heard it break the sound barriers and went by. And sometimes they also whistle as they go by your ear, which means it's really, really close. And then another bad thing is when you see the dust spots jumping up around your feet, that's a bad thing. And then the worst thing is the thud that you hear right before you fall over dead. There was a lot of snapping going on right here while I was taking this trip. And, and dust spots too. Returning fire. Again, setting up, with, that's a wadi. I mean, they, they sprint to these wadis, they get down and try to figure out what's going on, they return fire. Then they get up and they sprint again, and you have to stay with them. Your worst nightmare would be to get separated from the troops. And as Kelly said, the cornfields, I used to be, I hated them because you go in the cornfields and you have to keep a distance about six meters from the guy in front of you and the guy behind you in case somebody throws a hand grenade and doesn't kill all of you. But in those cornfields, they would disappear, and I think if he veers that way and I make a mistake and I veer that way, it's just like, it's your worst nightmare. I hated it. Searching for the guy who had just been shooting at us, and it turned out he was down the road. And they were actually able to shoot him, and he fell into a wadi. But again, there's people all over the place, spotters, and they zip up on these mopeds, and they grab him, and zip off and go, so they weren't able to actually apprehend him after they shot him, wounded him. This is an A&A guy. Uh, it is so hot. I just, I wish there was some way I could say something to make you realize what it's like to carry 80 pounds of body armor in a helmet when it's 125 degrees. It is just unreal. And he just shucked his clothes and jumped in the, basically it's an irrigation ditch. Coming back, I hated this sort of stuff. This is again, we're returning to base, and there's IEDs in those roads, and you just know that in any second, one of them can go off and just take your legs off. And it's just real scary. These are called mine rollers. These things, these are called MRAPs, and they're, they're half a million dollars worth of truck, and they've got these rollers designed so that theoretically, it'll hit the mine first and blow off before the truck is destroyed, but it doesn't happen very often. Oftentimes, the truck is destroyed. But you're going to see in a second. Back on patrol, there's the guys. Adam, Cal and I both went on patrol with the ANA. Of course, the idea is, as they say, we will stand down when they can stand up. They're trying to train the Afghan army to take over. And I went on one patrol and I said, I will never do that again. That's, that's it. And that is not exactly how you go on patrol with a machine gun. You don't hang it over your shoulder like that. It was very, very scary. And I said, that's it. I'm not doing that again. Corn, or cotton fields. And again, you know, there's furrows. And it's just incredibly difficult to walk through this. This was a patrol I was on where the truck in front of me got blown up by an IED, about a 100 pound IED, which you're going to see here in a second. Uh, turns out these things are so well designed that in that one, no one was actually injured. The people, the way they get hurt, because the machine gun is in an open turn, he's strapped in with all these straps. 
Sometimes he'll get a concussion. Um, but the Cat5 guys had what's called the boom jar, which was a jar full of cigars. Every time they got blown up, they would smoke a cigar. It was like, wow, they blow up, they get blown up, what do you say? They smoke a cigar. Well, where they do get killed, sometimes, because there's deep wadis on both sides of the road, sometimes the IED will flip the truck and it will crush the machine gunner as it rolls over, and then sometimes it rolls into a wadi, which is deep enough, everybody in the truck drowns. We just got blown up, and these guys are laughing, but that's exactly what's going on. We got attacked one, one morning, very early, which I'm going to show you a little clip on that, but we're under attack inside of the base, which isn't supposed to happen, but it did. This was this, the scariest moment of the whole time I was there, and Kelly had a, another scary moment after I left, but, but there was one night, and it was weird. When you got back inside the wire, theoretically, your, your life was still in danger, but you could take off your body armor and relax, sort of. You had to be careful of, if you heard an RPG, but it, like I said, it was rare. But one night they actually came and they said, gear up now, which was so weird. And so we put on our body armor and helmets and everybody was doing it. And so we, we said, why? And said, so we can't tell you. Great. So we followed the first sergeant back to the command tent and said, you, you got to tell us you know, what, what is going on. They had received information that a very large element of Taliban was coming our way and we're going to overrun the camp and that we would be hand-to-hand -hand fighting and probably half of us would be dead in the morning. Excuse me, what? And so I said, what do you want us to do? And he said, you're on your own. So I was like, well, thanks, you know, we don't have a weapon. So, and he said, well, and he showed us, there was an area, a little sandbag circle, and he said, we will direct the battle from there, and if we all die, we will go down fighting there. You, if you want to join us, you're welcome to. He's like, okay, great. So <laughs> we actually went out and we, we rehearsed our escape route, how we were going to get to that circle and all that. And then we sat down and did the thing you see in movies where, she told me what she wanted me to say in case she didn't make it, and I told her what I wanted her to say in case I didn't make it, and we told jokes to each other. And then because we're such professionals, we took all our camera gear up and checked all our settings and set everything out so that if it happened, if we died, game over. But if we didn't die, we'd have one hell of a story. And it turns out they bypassed our camp and didn't attack us. But I will tell you, for one entire night, I was convinced I was going to die. And I actually slept in my body armor. Callie didn't, but I slept in my body armor because I was convinced we were going to get Nothing to do, barbecues. One of the things I love when, when the family, we, we sent a care package recently. It takes about eight weeks for a care package to get there. They like spices and things because the food is so monotonous. Waiting in an MRAP to go out on patrol, look for mines. They go out on patrol sometimes 20 hours a day looking for IEDs. Just keep going until they run into one. Work them 24 hours a day. They just work 24 hours. It never stops. It never stops. <laughs> A guy named Dan Castaneda, he's from Detroit, and he was, he's a really fascinating guy, but he's one of my favorite Marines. He's over there, and he's in this Cat 5 group that goes out. They do all kinds of things, but mostly they look for IEDs. And he's been blown up several times. Water, about nine liters a day, I think, more than nine liters a day. You just can't get enough. You just can't get enough. Can you believe we went up? Sorry, that's good. Food? No, that's not true. <laughs> for you, maybe. Here's the feds, they're talking about the female engagement teams. That uh, they brought in because they got so tired of not being able to talk to them, and so they brought the union. And I will tell you what, tough as nails, carrying weapons, going on patrols, just like the male Marines. Don't, don't mess with them. This idea that women can't go in combat, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> these women are doing it on a regular basis. They really are. Marijuana, they tell me this is an important crop. I'm not sure why. Now, they had huge fields of marijuana, huge fields in the region. To, to the region, was just another obstacle program. It's also the number one place for all the opium. That's where it comes from, is this area where we went. This is a local, uh, very important village elder uh, that we went and sat with and asked him if he supported Tarzan. He said, of course I do, et cetera, et cetera. They're basically meaningless interviews, but we did them anyway. Bringing in detainees. Um, Callie had the, the very unusual experience of being eventually, because they didn't know what to do with it, they, did, they, didn't, they weren't used to having women at the front line. It was very unusual for, for uh, it was pretty unusual for a journalist to be up there, but it was very unusual for a female journalist. And so eventually they put Callie, she slept in the chapel for a while, and then they put her in a, a female tent. They took this one tent that the female tent, which was her, but it was right next to the detainee interrogation tent. So she get to listen, got to listen to them interrogate these guys all night long. And the rat. There's and the a rat, rat there. Only the female fans. And, <laughs> and this is just, I mean, they're just exhausted. I mean, they're just exhausted. They just, they, as soon as they sit down, they go to sleep. They're just exhausted. Uh, this is a, the last foot patrol I went on. 
guy's name is Ross Carver. And again, he's doing the same thing I told you about. Dan Louderman, Ross Carver is about ready to put down security so I can get up and sprint across that road to the other side. And so, did he save my life? I have no way of knowing. Was I shot going across the road? No. Is it because he was laying there providing security? Yeah, probably. So he probably saved my life. Maybe. Two days after this picture was taken, he was shot and killed. And I have a video of, of this patrol, and, and the, the thing was, when somebody is killed over there, Marines killed, they shut down all communications, all internet. We didn't have access to the internet either. Anyway, but some Marines did, but they shut it down because they want to make sure the next of kin are notified by the proper authorities. The officer who comes to the house and say, we, we got your form. So you always knew when a Marine was killed because it's it called uh, River City. They say River City, so there's no communication. And I was on my way, I went on this patrol, and then I was headed back, trying to get back to the States, and I had to go through several stages to get out of the country. And about two days into that, they came to me and said, ooh, my word, were you on that patrol? And I said, yeah. They said, do you have any pictures? And I said, yes, I pulled them up, and they informed me he'd been killed. So when I came back, because we were sending uh, multimedia clips into KVAL in Eugene, when we had access to internet, which was not very often, but I didn't want to, I had a clip with him, and I didn't want to air that until I talked to his widow to make sure she was okay with it. So I actually called her and talked to her about this. That was really, really difficult. He was, I think, maybe 20. I think she's 19. They had a uh, one-and-a-half-year-old son. It was really hard. And again, this is, I mean, it's the real stuff. They do put the dog tag in the boot in case their head gets blown off, the body can be identified. They do all that stuff. It's a really real concern. And there is a place in this Campo Camp Dwyer where for every Marine that dies, they take one set of his dog tags and they hang them in his clothes. So each one of those dog tags represents a Marine that was killed. Kelly and I were there. I got there. We left here the 1st of August, but I was there roughly a month in the combat zone. And Kelly was there for another month. But just the month that we were both there, eight Marines that we worked with were killed while we were there. And we just unfortunately found out last night that another Marine that we knew was killed. Okay, and now we're going to show you a couple of clips, and then we're going to open it up for questions. I think we'll some time for you. It is a light. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we went, I was in the light. Dan Morse reporting from Bob Marja in Helmand Province, Afghanistan. I just returned from a mounted patrol with jump. During patrol, one of our trucks was blown up by an IED. Good morning, gentlemen. I'm Staff Sergeant Santiago. All right, I'm going to be the mission uh, convoy commander for today's mission. All right, so gunners, give that extra observation to your VCs. Make sure that they're they're keeping their eyes open. The convoy had been traveling on the dirt roads about an hour when the IED went off. There was no warning, and in fact, children were seen playing in the area, which is usually an indication that the area is safe. It was probably about a hundred pound charge. Right there. Direction. You can't see him anymore. Just... Officer, can all personnel in the vehicle are stable and okay. Break. It was verified that no one was injured, and the men quickly established security. Later. Vehicle 1 began receiving small arms fire from a nearby field. An EOD team was called in the sweep for additional mines, and the men were relaxed behind the relative safety of berms, waiting for a tow truck to come to retrieve the damaged vehicle. Yeah, we were just driving down the road, going uh, down Hippo, and uh, hit IAD. And uh, well, I lose consciousness. The gunner here, he uh, had a bang his head. But, uh, I thought we got hit by a rocket. Everybody's okay, everybody's okay. Got our radio, say, hey, you know, we got mobility now. And uh, I'm good. I remember trying looking, I seen like, about five, six little kids standing on top of like garage, squashing us. And next thing you know, it's like, boom, we hit, put me here, my head, this thing got thrown down like a rag doll, I slammed, and everybody was okay. Um, this time on the IED, we pretty much got lucky. Thank God nobody uh, got a little cuts, little bruises, but everybody safely made it out. The trucks these men travel in, MRAPs, mine resistant, ambush proof vehicles, cost nearly half a million dollars when they're fully outfitted. 
That's a lot of U.S. tax dollars. But to the Marine Station and Marja District of Helmand Province, these trucks are worth every penny. we got a couple more clips, and then we're going to open up for questions. So the next one is what I was talking about earlier, where you're going out on the IED suite. Then the middle, we have EOD with the uh, mine detector, and they're sweeping uh, the main road. And what we're looking for is IEDs, uh, looking for indicators where you might see uh, the ground disturbed, my stomach, it gets upset. And that's usually when I know we'll find something. But right now, it's kind of 50-50. On the first road, there are no IEDs to be found. But as the sweep continues, rounds from small arms fire and RPGs are fired from under a mile away. As the sound of the firefight fills the air for nearly a half an hour, Marines look for any enemy forces moving in their direction. The explosive ordnance technician, Staff Sergeant Pedro Hernandez, is not distracted by the gun battle. While his attention is focused on finding any evidence of a possible IED. On a nearby road, Hernandez finds an IED. He said, I got one. Hernandez searches the area. He also looks for possible booby traps, which could initiate the explosion. When the IED is deemed safe, Hernandez prepares to remove the jug. Marines wait, crouch down, and ears plugged in case of an explosion. Marines are relieved when the IED is removed intact. Hernandez carries the disarmed IED into an isolated area far from the trucks for controlled detonation of the explosive. Inside the trucks, Marines start the countdown. the hole where the IED was buried and continue with the sweep. Yeah. Like I said, in, in general, we were told that if we were inside a copy, a, cop, a, a combat outpost, that probably we wouldn't be attacked inside the car. <laughs> one morning, it was, it was so hot, and, and there's two different kinds of tents, and I had one that was specifically designed to land a military cot, and Callie had one that wouldn't quite fit, so I said, okay, give me, I'm, I can't take it, I'm gonna sleep outside tonight. So I had a tent that I was totally unfamiliar with, and I was sleeping basically out in the middle of the, this open courtyard when an RPG came in, and they attacked, and I, all, <laughs> I thought I was gonna die because I could not find the zipper, I didn't know where the zipper was. I thought I was gonna die because I had this tent that I wasn't familiar with. Um, but this is what happened. This, I, this firefight actually lasted over an hour. lasted about an hour. Although two RPGs could be heard flying overhead, sources say the actual attack was directed at the Afghan road security contractors outside. I was sleeping in my cot. I was wide awake. And uh, the first RPG went off. So we're off and we're on. Yes, I was 
showing them uh, where the best spot to put their M240 Bravo. And it's in between the ESCOs where they have limited uh, left and lateral limits. So if they put it up on, on the ESCO, they could swing it out to the side support. And then once the fire started, they ran up to their post. They weren't in stable firing positions. They couldn't see too much. Some of the machine guns might have not been perfectly aimed. But we are working on that, so that's, that's part of the reason that we're here. Just so it is. Um, Couple more real quick clips and then we're gonna open up to questions. So the next one's it's a firefight that I was in. I was you don't know who's earlier. friend and who's foe until they have a weapon in their hand. So until you are out on patrol and then they come out with a weapon in their hand and you're able to gain good positive identification of you know a hostile act or hostile intent with a weapon to you, then you know you can engage them. Where did that come from? Go. Go. Come on. Um, one of the shooters, I was able to engage with a saw, and he was probably about 300 meters away, and I shot a pretty <coughs> long burst at him. The individual, I seen him stumble, so that is one of the ones that I hit. Total, we bounded um, through three wadis, and on the fourth one is the building iron at us from previously. We had three Taliban that were wounded that uh, fled the scene. Then we had one was able to apprehend, and that's what the medevac was. <laughs> and on the compounds that we were searching, it was uh, where the Taliban would go to the local nationals, bust through their door, drag their fellow Taliban members that were injured, were dragging them through from one compound to another. Ended up finding a blood trail in a compound, questioned the individual, and he was really, uh, didn't want to be too cooperative. You know, he couldn't give me the straight truth. Okay, so that's what we're doing, looking on the ground for a blood trail. It's really frustrating because you are here to help these people and you go out and do well projects for them and everything, but still they take from us what we give them and they're still helping Taliban. Okay, one more and then the question. And I think we're supposed to be out of the building around eight but asking each other stupid questions and I asked her, I was like, if I died, would you ever let go? And she said no. So she's holding a skull and it just kind of represents my wife, you know, hanging on to me no matter what happens to me. Alright, I got this tattoo a few months before I came to Afghanistan. Uh, 
the St. Michael's. It's uh, supposed to be good luck, and that's a uh, protection of all the evils. So I got it so it helped me out here, you know, protect me. It's just uh, the blank face and the Grim Reaper just to remind me that it comes in all forms. We can't see it or know when it's going to happen. But we always got to remember that it's possible at any time. Uh, my chest, the letter Crucio or Latin Torment, just reminds something to remind me of why I joined the Marine Corps and why I got out of my own life. I'm going downhill hanging out with the wrong people doing the wrong things. And uh, I decided one day that I was done with it. Came into the Marine Corps and it was the best decision of my life. I was actually watching the Discovery Channel, and it was a special on lionesses. And pretty much, lionesses are they are the queens of the jungle. So they do all the work. The lion just stays home and watches the kids. My daughter was born on April 23rd, 2007. I missed her birth because I was in Iraq. So I figured I owed her something. So I got this for her when I got home. When I met her, when she was five months old. And when I get back, right on top of it, my son's gonna be born here in three weeks. So when I get back, I'm gonna get a thicker one for a boy, and I'm gonna write his name on top of it, because I'm gonna really miss his birth for this deployment. And then uh, John 1513, uh, no greater love than this, that I may lay down his life for his friends. I mean, it's, I would die for anyone in the squad. The bad company is uh, for me and my buddies back home, uh, just drinking beer in the woods, you know? Just, we're always back up when we're around, you know. Uh, the USMC, I got, the day I got out of boot camp, I was motivated, still am kind of. And then <laughs> in my chest or my pectoral, it's to live and to die. Uh, I just, that's my feeling. I sh you should have a choice to live or to die. So. And then on my rib cage, it's honor. I'm honoring my family being here and graduating high school. And then the one on my back of the job is to mean that my mom made peace with God when she passed away in 2005. because we were filing online stories. Again, we almost never had access to an internet line. It's called a white line. Who shot the video? We did well, both. We, we did both. Uh, we worked <coughs> as a team. It just depended on what was going on, what mood we were in. Uh, so sometimes Callie would take the, the, the video camera, sometimes I would. It just, there was no rule on that. We just, whatever we felt like. We shot, by the way, in case anybody wants to know, because this is of interest to some people. Everything you saw. <laughs> Everything you saw was shot with this guy. This guy right here. That's called a Kodak ZI. All that video was shot with this guy. Right here. 
that, that big baby right there, as much as I would have loved to have one of these things on the floor running across the field, not likely. Yes, sir. So, Dan, did you plan to do this on the 235th anniversary or birthday of the Marine Corps? <laughs> no, but, but I'm glad I did. But I'll tell you what's weird. What's really weird about this, this was the Marines don't like to be called 26, and, and at least I didn't call them soldiers, which I know somebody would do. But in any case, the, the second battalion sixth regiment. I was in Beirut in 84 with the multinational forces. It was the 26. I was stunned. I thought, my word, I keep running into these guys. So, no, but anyway, all that video was shot on this guy right here. Sorry, we interrupted the phone. I'm sorry, did, I'm sorry, there was a gentleman back here with a question. I'm sorry. What, what date were you there? Uh, we left uh, Portland Airport on one August 3rd. August 3rd, like I said, August 3rd. I had to get back because I actually have a real job. What year? This year, just this, this year, just yeah, this summer. Uh, so um, I had to get back by to teach at the University of Oregon where <coughs> luckily thank you, Al, thank you, thank you. Uh, he's giving me a job tonight. Oh there he is <laughs> back there. Yeah, and so I had to get back by Cali because she's a gypsy. She said, ah oh, whatever. So she, st she stayed for three months. And I will tell you, it's very, very, they did not want us to stay. When we requested permission to go, they said, you can only stay for two weeks. We said, well, that's crazy. We're staying at least for a couple of months at the minimum. They said, well, you can't stay any longer than two weeks anywhere. We said, that is also crazy. But they don't like you to do it because the men get used to you and they get comfortable around you and they start saying things that the higher, higher uppity bucks don't want them to say. So it was very unusual. They liked Callie so much and trusted her so much. I can tell you stories about Callie under fire. It was astonishing to see her work, and the Marines were just amazed at what she would do on combat patrol work. And she was not, any time, I never could see it, that it phased her the least. So they really took to her and wanted her to stay. And I will tell you, and her, to her credit, there was a couple of folks in the New York Times that said, get out, and they let Callie stay. They really liked having Callie around because she was so reliable. And they thought she was doing a fair job. They thought we both did. That, you know, sometimes, oops, sometimes we would report things we were uncomfortable with, but they felt like we were very fair to I'm sorry, there was a question on the first one. It seems like there were firefights every day, is that right? Somewhere. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's what I'm saying, it's a weird thing. Go ahead. The, well, I mean, I was there for three months, so, it, I mean, there were firefights every day, usually somewhere, not necessarily that we were on, but um, there were some times where it got really slow. But um, like on a lot of patrols, especially in the beginning where there, there was at least, you know, a firefight going on here and maybe we were going this way. But there were pop shots. So like later on when I was there, there'd be a couple days where there was nothing and you're like, wait, so it was quiet and that, and you know that when it's quiet and you think that's a big deal, that, you know, I think that there was a lot. We, it was really, it, it, just an odd thing. We got there, Ramadan was about to happen when we got there and they didn't know whether Ramadan would increase the violence or not. And it turns out it increased the violence dramatically. They told us that. There was not a day, and again, it's this weird thing, because there was not a day that I was there that we didn't hear a firefight or an ID going off. Now, again, we went on patrols that were not directly at that, but you could always hear one very nearby somewhere. But then again, it sort of died down later. We thought, they were surprised when I'm on that first patrol and we came into check. That was the first time they had taken contact in something like four or five days. Yeah, it, it surprised them. Like it's, but it's fairly frequent, I'll tell you that. Do our troops pay premiums? Oh, sure, absolutely. Oh, yeah, they have to. If you wound, the rules are if you wound somebody, you have to try to save his life and take him prison. <coughs> and, and for all good reasons, but also because they want intelligence from you. They want to find out what they can to make it safer to do their job. There was a question in the room. Yes. Kelly, there are a lot of conflicts in the world. Why did you choose Afghanistan? What was your goal and motivation throughout your life to have you achieve that goal? Oh, the page, yeah, it's you. <laughs> I mean, like I said before, part of the reason was because here I had this amazing chance to go with Dan. If Dan hadn't started that process, I probably wouldn't have gone looking for it. Um, but, you know, I spent a year in Iraq inside the bases, and it was a very limited view of everything. And I knew that um, Dan wanted to go with the Marines. I knew that, um, or we didn't know, but I was hoping that we would get outside the wire, that we would be with infantry going out. Um, and seeing, you know, being able to interact with the locals, being able actually to see what's going on. In Iraq, with the, I was able to see everything that Medevac was doing, but you're only going from base to base. You're not actually, you know, I mean, we can't say, like Dan said earlier, anything about what's going on in the war in Afghanistan, but we can say what went on in Marja. You know, we were in four different um, positions in Marja. Um, so to be able to see that firsthand, to be able to tell the stories of these young men, say that I saw this firsthand and come back and you know even tonight like it's 
so amazing to me to watch people watch that video because you know the men and, and the Marines and everything you see it becomes so important to you because that's where you're living your life becomes that um, so in that way you know I feel like I accomplished some things you know I mean you we're in Marja I was in some other places but you're you're very limited to if you're with the military you're not seeing all of Afghanistan you just see this little tiny pocket of it so I mean you do have a limited but let me, and this is the corny part of the presentation, but I, I think it's an important part. Uh, every election, they send out these surveys on the most important issues questions. And in the last the midterms, a couple weeks back, that question was, what's the most important issue to you as a voter? And Afghanistan was identified by 3% of the American population. They just don't care. And I will tell you, I'm a very, very firm believer that democracy is the best government. There's, it is a terribly bad and flawed form of government, but I believe it is still is the best. But it only works if the people are informed. And Kelly and I talked about this quite a bit. Do we, did we think we would change anybody's mind or anything? That's not really our job. Our job is just to say, here's what's going on. You do what you want with that information. But we both felt strongly, and still feel very strongly, that at least you can't say we didn't know. But if you didn't know, you didn't look. Because we, we just risk our lives to bring you that information out. But do with that information what you want. But don't say somebody wasn't trying to give you information. Because not only us, lots of very brave people over there doing it. I mean, there are lots of journalists who go out, a couple of them in the room because I see them on Butter Wall, who've done this sort of work. The idea that we didn't know what was going on, well, it's because you're not paying attention. Because there are people who, like Callie and others in the room here, who go out and try to get you that information. But it, you know, I, will tell you, I, will tell you, I will tell you, I find it discouraging that only 3% of the American people consider it to be a very important issue. It's like, wow, that's, that's amazing. I think you were the first thing. Yeah. Uh, the point you're making, uh, Exposure is limited, and of course, sure. one reason is because major, minor, most media don't treat it. Yes, it's, well, it's, 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 it's incidental to things that are much more sensational, as uh, unfortunately our culture responds to. Yep. Um, I had a technical question: if they march straight ahead in an open field yes. at full exposure, yeah. uh, is the idea to draw fire, identify Taliban, return fire? No, the idea, the, the idea really is. I mean, uh, first of all. Well, I'm going to sound kind of a jerk like this, but I don't mind. I'm kind of a jerk by nature. The Taliban are really crappy fighters. They really are. And they do this. Some of them. Well, some of them. Well, some There's of them. A few, yeah. though, yeah, because yeah. there were three um, Marines that were killed within three right. days. So. Right. There, there was a sniper there who was digging people right before he left. He was, he was scary. By and large, because of the rules of engagement, they understand the rules of engagement. They know that the Marines can't or won't shoot them unless they're positive ID. So they do this thing called. Uh, Spray and fade, where they'll stick machine gun around the corner and spray a field, and when you get close enough, they'll throw it down and they'll run away, and somebody on the scooter will come by and snatch it and go. Okay, so the reason, one of the reasons the Marines sprint towards the ambush is they're trying to get there to cut off the escape route of the Taliban who's trying to kill them so he won't be working the next day trying to kill them the next day. That's one of the very <coughs> reasons. It's a, it doesn't happen very often because the Taliban knows as soon as the Marines are getting close, they just walk off. Are they poor shooters? They're, it's not that they're poor shooters, they're not, certainly some of them are, are, are deadly. There was a sniper who shot a couple of our friends right before we left, shot a guy through the neck on the post. By and large, they're not trained in the same way, at least the Marines were trained. They just shoot in your general direction. That doesn't mean you're not going to get killed if you get hit by a round. But by and large, they don't take their time, they don't, they don't do, I have a video, which we didn't show you tonight, of a Marine trying to take out a guy who's in a building trying to kill us. All <coughs> That's not the way to tell them to fight. And they're not across the board. I mean, you could have an area where they are, you know, they're different Taliban fighters. I mean, it, they're not equally trained. Like, the, it differs from area from day to day. I mean, you you really have no idea what you're up against on a given day. I mean, it could be one guy, it could be four guys, it could be six guys. I mean, it's really an ever-changing situation. We talked to some Marines who once, and again, they go out in, in a squad, and the squad is two fire teams, so essentially it's ten men. And we talked to uh, these one guys who said that they're, they, one day they were pinned down by 18 Taliban, which was usually unheard of. Usually it was two or three guys, Taliban. But they, they walked into an ambush that was 18 strong, and they were pinned down for about 12 hours, which included air support. They had helicopter gunships coming in, but they said that was unbelievable. So. Yes, sir. Um, you described um, repeatedly the way that the soldiers in combat enter a state where they find that normal. Yep. It's a very abnormal state for most of us. Yep. 
Um, and I think a lot of what I'm trying to take away from this is that trip. I mean, you, you said that you were there in part to share the experience of being there. Did you find yourselves embracing that at all? Did you notice the changes that you were going through getting used to being in a combat situation? Yes, what did that, that feel like for you? <laughs> no, I, no, I don't mean to make light of it. I, I gotta tell you something. Truly, like Callie's heard me say this. I would get up in the morning and they would say, you wanna go on patrol again today? I'd say, sure. And I'd think, oh, God, no. Callie was much better than me at this. No, I never got to the point where I thought this was a lot of laughs. There was a lot of, of that stuff that goes on in there that I found highly entertaining. I'm a risk taker, high sensation seeker, and I'm an extrovert. So did I get a kick from being an army chef? Yes, I did. Did I wanna go out on patrol with them? No, I did not, but it was my job. And I'm telling you, by the, Callie can tell you, by the end of it, I said, I have had enough. Because it seemed like every time I would go outside where else somebody tried to kill me, and I just got tired of it. I think, and the thing for that, I think everything's become relative. Like what Sam was saying before, they said, well, things are like safe here now in this one area. And it's like, because we weren't there three months before when all hell was breaking out. Um, like on the day of the election, the place they were at was surrounded by Taliban and the RPGs were flying overhead, but they weren't the whistles that were flying by my head. So all of a sudden, like, this is a good situation. Like, I feel fine. Like, the firefights are out here. The RPGs are most likely not going to hit this building. So you become, you know, you have to make, you know, comparisons because that becomes, you know, I was there, I was in Afghanistan for about three months. So your whole world shrinks down to that. And so if one day the bullets are actually going by your head and the next day they're not, that becomes a good day. And I will also tell you one of the things you learn, what, for if you've never been under fire in combat, it's surprising to see. If you watch that video of when Simba was under attack and people were just strolling by with no helmets on, when it comes to bullets, an inch is as good as a mile. Okay, if, you, if I'm here and that's the end of the wall and the bullets are coming here, it doesn't matter. They're not gonna hit. And they know that. They understand the risk. And so, uh, Callie, you saw her filming them, these guys looking up and down, laughing and talking to each other. It's because they're behind a wall. They can't possibly get hit and they know it. It is stunning to people who are not under fire to see that. That is not true when you go on patrol when you're out in the field. You can be killed at any point. But inside the HISCO, unless a grenade comes in, which that one night they said that's what was going to happen, they understand the risk. They know how all this stuff works. And so they do things just like that. This is scary stuff. Not really, because they know the risk. So it seems odd. I don't know that. Yes, ma'am. Um, you were in the Marines in the 1970s. Obviously, there's been a I don't know how much technology has changed, to tell you the truth. They, they're shooting M4s as opposed to M16s. The truth matter is when I went through boot camp, it was an M14. I actually carried an M14. There's not much difference in those weapons. They, they have scopes and things. Psychologically, I mean, these are men in a, in a place that's nasty and dirty and hot, and they risk their life every day. I was not in Vietnam. My only two brothers were, but I wasn't a combat marine. I was actually the group program of all things. So I don't know what it was like to be a combat marine in the 70s. But do I think it's changed in the, the locale? It's not a jungle, it's a desert. It's still going out and risking your life and trying to kill the enemy is the same no matter what. I don't think that ever changes. I doubt that that changes since the Civil War or even, or even Caesar. I just don't think that changes. Dealing with the fact that every day may be your last day, I don't think that ever changes. I don't think. I had that contact from being a University of Oregon student. I first contacted Dan, and Dan was my big link um, in preparing for that. Um, and he actually gave me like a crash course in multimedia because I'd never done multimedia. And he also introduced me into Mark Furman at KBAL, which is why I had to do multimedia because it was a TV station. So, um, so you know, I mean, having Dan. Um, and I knew him because he was my professor, and I took his photojournalism class because um, I didn't have to, it wasn't one of the classes that you have to take another one to get in. So it, was, it was easy to get into. Um, best thing I ever did. Thank you. Um, but uh, as far as, you know, I think 
these things, like you really have to do it. I mean, there's there's no classes that are gonna prepare you. I mean, in Iraq, like one of the most difficult things was like, how do you get a multimedia piece inside of a helicopter? Because like that's sometimes the only space you have. If you have five feet of space, I mean, that's not something that you're working on. Um, or like, I did a year long embedded project with the same soldier, so, you know, that was something that I wasn't prepared to do out of school. I mean, some of those things you really have to do it, but, um, you know, having, um, you know, met Dan there, having, you know, because of Dan, like, and some other professors that I know, like, I always can go back to the university and, you know, have that people here that, um, you know, that are just a wealth of information. Like, if there's any students out there, like, the best thing that you can do is have, you know, a mentor that um, is willing to help you out because it's just made, like, a total difference. But I'll also say, and they address a little bit of that. One of the things in the, the uh, accreditation process, as it stands today, this changes from administration to administration. And Callie was in Iraq under President Bush, and so I have no idea what that was like. But I know what it's like now. There's some paperwork right there. It's a huge stack of stuff you got to get filled up numerous times, it seems like. But you don't, not only do you have to get a, a legitimate news organization to vouch for you, to give you credentials, you have to be published within that, with that organization, a minimum of five times. So you just can't go to a newspaper and say, you want to give me credentials? That won't work. They don't want freelancers over there, basically. Uh, so you have to have been published five times. And we have been enormously lucky at the School of Journalism and Communication at SOJC down at the University of Oregon. Um, Mark Herman, who works for King on that, at one point he was an adjunct lecturer at the school. And so we have a really good relationship with him in KVAL. And because of that, Cali had actually been published in KVAL. And which time Scott Nelson, who was hiding over there by the wall, has helped me enormously because we have another entire two sets of students who have gone through the multimedia class up here in Chinatown, which they have been, the Oregonian has been nice enough to publish as well. So because the school is so involved and because we get so much support from the Oregonian and from KVAL and from various other publications, but especially those two, this Oregon and KVAL, that's the reason she was allowed to go. That's definitely the reason she was allowed to go to Iraq and the reason she was allowed to go to Afghanistan is because she did go to Iraq and because they should have stacked up these publications. So we, we're really lucky, our students are very lucky in that they get out and they're published. I, I, again, Scott Nelson is standing right over there. He's published a lot of work from our students from Old Town Chinatown. He's about to do another set here coming up in a couple of weeks. And that allows our students to go immediately into the job field, so to speak, as soon as they graduate. So big props to them. We couldn't do without them, that's just the truth, we couldn't. Yes, sir? If you take a hundred pictures out there in a day, you don't crop and edit there. Oh, yes, you do. <laughs> oh, yes, you do. Yeah, we took our laptops with us, yes. I mean, we didn't leave that area. I mean, you're there. Like, I was there for two months. Like, I sometimes I was outside for a week, like, literally not go inside even a tent for a week. And you do all your work outside in the sand, sometimes without electricity. You know, I mean, you, you just have to be there. We, we were... But yes, we did have our laptops, and yes, we did all that work there. And we would, we never knew when we were going to get access to an internet line, so we would stack. And Callie and I would come in, you'd be so hot and exhausted and just stressed out on the fact that somebody just tried to kill you. And you say, well, we have to work tonight because we don't know if they're going to give us access to an internet line tonight. It could happen. Sometimes they would come and say, ooh, white line's up, you want it? Well, you better have your work done because that'd be maybe the only chance you get for several days. So even though you didn't feel like it, you had to do it. But we were at bases that didn't have electricity, and they plug in your laptop to a converter on one of these in routes, and they just keep the motor running all night long, and you're going off of that. But yes, indeed, we did all this work in the field, absolutely. How many photographs would you send back while you were doing it for TV? Well, it was multimedia, but a multimedia package these days traditionally is a, a text of somewhere between 200 to 500 words. Usually they embed a half a dozen or up to a dozen images within that. And then the clip, which is usually around two minutes, which you just saw. So that is a package. And we were doing about a package a day the, every, the whole time we were there. So, but but if you want to know, it's like how many pictures did we shoot? Uh, I don't know, a couple of thousand, you know, most of which never see the light of day again. I, when I got back, I took my images and it was well over 2,000 images. And I edited it down to roughly 300 that I liked. And then you saw 34 of those. Yes, Austin. Yeah. Well, I'm just wondering how much gear are you bringing into the field? Because, like you said, Afghanistan, never, I guess a nasty place. You got to be hard up. It's like you know what, well, night comes, go down. So, like, <laughs> how, how, how much are you bringing in there? I took two bodies and destroyed one night on the very first patrol I was on. I got up in this range of 
water. You want that there can you drop in the water? No, I took I took two I took two bodies and uh, about four lenses because I knew if one went down, there was a good chance we'd have a backup. We took the ZIA. We also had two backup mini DVD cassette uh, video recording. We did not use because we liked the ZIA so much. We didn't use it. If I went back, would I do that again? Uh, I actually I took three bodies. I, I, yeah, I had three bodies and four lenses. Uh, and I had one that was, wasn't very high quality, but it was my absolute last case scenario backup. It, it's horrible in here. You, your, your gear is just going to get destroyed. It is, and you need a patch in that age. Yeah. But you can't carry it all. And it's just not awful. You run out of the field. I went out to the first patrol with two cameras around my neck, plus a ZI, and I came back and said, I'm never doing that again. And so I would take one camera and the ZI. Yep. Uh, Kelly, your experience in Iraq and uh, Afghanistan is that opened up any new doors for you? Has it made any changes in what you're going to do with the rest of your career? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, you know, I, like Dan said, I, I probably wouldn't have been prepared to go to Afghanistan or been able to go um, if I hadn't been in Iraq. Um, I, you know, I've been able to freelance for um, like the BBC and to freelance for the Oregonian and some other papers that I probably wouldn't have you know, been able to do that for right away. Um, you know, I just applied for a job with Stars and Stripes, but I hear that everyone's applying for it around <laughs> this area. So, um, you know, I mean, it would be great if this would pay off in um, my career, but it, it's hard to tell right now. I've been, you know, I've been working as a freelancer for a year and a half. Um, so, you know, I mean, as a journalist or a person, like I think these experiences are just invaluable. Um, and you know, as a freelancer, I have been able to sell some of my work out. Um, but I mean, sometimes it's a challenge. I mean, you're in March and you think that all this stuff is going on, and then you're still having trouble selling stuff. So sometimes that's frustrating too. Yeah. Okay, let me, this, this, is a, this, this is a very fair question. Let me yeah. just tell you this. If you read anything on counterinsurgency, and this is the counterinsurgency Bible for the American Forces, but this is based on a book called he, Learning to Eat Soup with a uh, Knife, which is uh, a, a British book on their, their experience in Malaysia. There's only been one successful counterinsurgency in the history of the warfare, and that's the British in Malaysia. Okay, it took them 20 years, and they used genocide and torture to accomplish their goals. If you talk to them, and this is a fair question, if you talk to them and Lieutenant Colonel Ellison, I said, what is victory? Okay, victory is, and I would remind them, look, I know this stuff, I know what the ratios are, I know the time, it takes 10 years, and for every 20 people in the population of the area you're at, you need a troop. So if you do the math, it calls for 580,000 American troops in Afghanistan for the next 10 years. Okay, because I said, we've been here nine years. They said, no, 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 we haven't been in Marge in nine years. We've been here one year. So they, so, so they will tell you, they'll be quite honest. And I will tell you something interesting. They would say, did you not read this? Because it's all in here. Sarah Sewell <coughs> tells you exactly what to expect. And she says, either support it or don't. But here's how it's going to work. Ten more years, roughly hundreds of thousands of U.S. troops. And at the end of that, and I'm not making this up. This is a quote from Lieutenant Colonel Ellison. At the end of that, we will have acceptable levels of violence and a dictatorship in Kabul. That's victory. Now that's in the book, and it's also a direct quote from Lieutenant Colonel Ellison. And he says, and your problem with that is, how many years have we been in Korea? Still there. Still there. How long have we been, had bases in Japan? Still there. And his, his point is, and your problem with that is? Yes, sir. What's your assessment overall about the reporting that's being done about Afghanistan? I can only tell you what she did, but I saw her work and her work stinks. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, have no, I have no idea. I will tell you, I was not, because I don't know, I'm serious, I don't know. Kelly was able to be around with some pretty big name journalists after I left. I just wasn't there when they came in, they blew in and did some things. I wasn't there, I don't know. I will tell you, I was absolutely, utterly unprepared for the levels of violence that we saw. And I, I still kind of curious as to why I did not know that. I will tell you, it's not covered because unless somebody is killed, it doesn't usually make the news. And very few, thankfully, very few Marines are getting killed. Ah, heck of a lot of them are getting their legs or arms blown off and all that. 
But that doesn't usually make the news. And so unless somebody is killed, and even then I'm shocked, well, I know for a fact it doesn't make the news, because we know nine, now 10 people that have been killed since we were there, none of which make the news. I just was absolutely shocked at the level of violence when I got there. I really was. Why is that going on? I mean, you'd have to talk to the editor or someone, because I don't know. I really don't know. I think we have about five more minutes or so before they're going to throw us out of the building. Was there another question over there? You want to take that side of the yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. So, uh, Dan, with your vast uh, temporal knowledge of war from Gettysburg, uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'm curious if you have any comments on how wartime journalism has changed over time. Oh, goodness gracious. It crazy. relates yes. a bit to what you were just That's saying. That's an entire background presentation, which I refuse to learn. So, uh, <laughs> well, no, I mean, in, on a serious note, that is, that's a huge topic. But I will tell you the shorthand version of that is because, well, that's not true in this case, because there's some the people in here have been around and know how this stuff works. The truth of the matter of this embed process, which Kelly and I just went through, and people kind of grouse about, and for a lot of very good reasons, um, that's the way it's always been. Journalists were embedded in World War II. Journalists were embedded in Korea and World War I. It is a myth to think that this is a brand new idea. It is not true at all. What was a new idea was to let the press go willy-nilly in Vietnam, which I think was a really, really good idea, but the military to this day will still tell you the press lost the war in Vietnam. And there's a book out, by the way, from Ray Cole, it's called The Good War, what is it called? Where he talks about, in fact, we actually won that war, but the press lied about it, okay? The military still holds on to it, and they'll tell you to your face that we actually won that war, but the press lied about it. So I happen to think the way the press corps operated in Vietnam is the way all war should work. But it's a myth to think that this new embed is this brand new restricted way. No, that's the way it was always done. It was always done. When you, if you were an, if you were a credit journalist in World War II, you got the rank of captain, and you were given a 45 pistol on the and you wore a uniform. So it was Vietnam and it's an anomaly. I have to think that was the better model. But, but I will also tell you there's a book out called Unembedded about these journalists in Iraq. Okay, good for them. Except you're not going to be unembedded in Afghanistan, at least not where we were. I guarantee you, you would last for 30 seconds, a minute. You walked outside the wall, you'd be dead. They just drop you. Now, I can't speak for Kandahar or Kabul or anywhere else. But the, the press corps, one of the things. We've gone back to being in bed, which is the way it was always done. I will also tell you, because this always sort of comes up, and I'm surprised nobody's asked, were we ever censored? No. I was just <coughs> amazed. They never, ever said, you can't report this. You can't go here. They said, what do you want to do? And we would tell them, and we'd go off and do it. To the point, truly, to the point where, at one point, remember when we were down in Gulf, and that great big guy was arguing with me about the history of war and all that? He's the one that invited me to go to Mexico. Anyways. They got to the point where they would say, we're going to go out. Kelly went out at one patrol with essentially, what, three guys, whatever? Well, they, we separated yeah. with two A&A and &A soldiers in one room. I was invited to go on night patrols with spoofs, CIA guys who were going out to either capture or kill the enemy. And I said, no, no thanks. There was no censorship whatsoever. Now, I understand in the Iraq war that was different, but I wasn't there. I'm just telling you, in this war, they let us do whatever we wanted. Now, having said that, Kelly and I also know how this is supposed to be done, and we were careful not to do things to give away operational security, OPSEC, that would get Marines killed. And they, they quickly realized that they could trust us, that we weren't going to go out and show a picture of something that we weren't supposed to show, not because they were embarrassed what the Marines were doing, but it might get that Marine killed. So they quickly realized the experience that she had had in Iraq and my previous experience was valuable. So they trusted us very, very quickly. One more yeah, sure. Yes, sir. Yeah, I have enjoyed this tonight. I appreciate your bringing this to us. But I'm afraid I must take exception to something you just said. Sure. Your, the military thinks that we should have, that we won the war in Vietnam, the press lost it. I think that's a way a big overstatement. I'm retired military, it was in Vietnam. Okay. And I can tell you that most of my friends don't think like that at all. And, I'm, and God bless you. Go ahead and get Sobel's book where he says we won the war twice. Pardon me? Go ahead and get Sobel's book, S-O-B-E-L. He just, just came out last year. And we had... Well, that, that's one person's view, but certainly the military okay. is not just no, no. one view. You're absolutely... And, and I will tell you, I, they treated us one more. Sure. But I will also tell you, Thomas Ricks has a book that came out a few years ago called The Making of a Marine, where he quotes the drill instructors telling the Marines, the press is in here. I will also say... Again, thank you for saying that. And Petraeus in here says it. The media is not enemy stopping. But in Iraq, Odierno said, yes, they are. Mm -hmm. Now, he, Odierno used to be Petraeus' boss, and now 
he works for Petraeus. Petraeus has said they are not the enemy. But there's a whole entire bunch of people who are majors and down who still will tell you to your face, you lost the war for us. It wasn't I, mean, I think there was probably three or four times, and obviously it's not everyone, and it, uh, most people were really even glad to have us there, it felt like. And there were, you know, maybe three or four individuals that would bring up that subject that they had heard that, you know, the that one guy had said to me that he felt like the, the reason that we weren't winning that war in Afghanistan was from the media. So, I mean, and everyone has their individual opinion, you know, but I, I mean, most of the time in Afghanistan, people were, open and wanted to be interviewed. Yeah, we, they, they treated us wonderful, I will tell you that, but I, we certainly argued with Lieutenant Wheeler and others who, etc. It's, it's a prevailing view amongst a lot of the officers, and unfortunately we had to shut it down. Thank you so much.